data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, even your relative's information, it's all out there. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Ken Maines here from Unsolved No More. Listen, every once in a while, a product comes along that changes the game. That's Aura. It's so easy to set up. I did it in under three minutes. Listen, my family is my number one priority, keeping them safe. It's your priority too. That's why I partnered with Aura. 24 seven monitoring, parental controls, antivirus, and so much more in one app. Listen, you guys know I'm huge on integrity. And I would never endorse something that I did not personally use or believe in. And that's why I'm asking you to sign up for a free two-week trial of Aura. Just go to the link below in the comments, in the description. www.aura.com backslash unsolved no more. Sign up for your two-week free trial and get the protection that you and your family deserves. Yeah, let's talk about fears. Yeah, let's talk about Okay, I'm back. Today I'm going to talk about the Delphi murder case from February 13th, uh, 2017. This was requested a lot that I look at. I'm finally getting some time this morning to do it. Um, I had researched this for a couple weeks now. Uh, one of the things that I want to say right off the bat is this case is one of the most difficult because the police officers, the investigators on this have done such a tremendous job of keeping things secret. And by that, I mean, not giving their hand, not uh, letting the public know what they know. And I promise you, they know a lot more, a lot more than what's out there. Um, so kudos to them for being able to do that. Uh, that's very difficult to do in such a high uh, publicized case like this. But uh, it's also detrimental in a way because I get torn because I know why they do that. But as the case gets older and older, I think sometimes you have to release more and more information in order for uh, the public to get it, in order to get help to solve it. But they, they have, it looks like, released more information as we've gone forward. Uh, so let's get into, into what I found, okay? Uh, if you're new to uh, this channel, my name's Ken Maines. I've invested cold cases for over a decade, maybe uh, two decades now. Uh, I've done it professionally in a law enforcement setting for the district attorney's office, uh, police officer. I worked undercover with the FBI. I ran a drug task force, uh, blah, blah, blah. The reason I tell you that shit all the time is so when people look at this, they don't think that I'm just some random, you know, folk off the street that's just trying to uh, come up with this stuff. There's actual, you know, I've had training and it's a passion for mine. It always has been. And that's the reason, you know, um, 
you know, I had the five episode uh, docu-series Hunt for the Zodiac Killer on the History Channel. And I've been on the Reels channel and uh, Discovery Science and all those things. I organized a, uh, a cold case unit that looked at these cases for free uh, that had the best in the business. I recruited and worked alongside with them from Henry Lee, Warner Spitz, Cyril Weck, Joe Kenda, um, just Mary Ellen O'Toole, Jim Clemente, just a bevy of great investigators. Uh, so I created that and worked along with them and looked at hundreds of cool cases. So that gives a foundation of where I'm coming from. So when I looked at this case uh, of the victims, Abby Williams and uh, Liberty German, 13 and 14 year olds. If you're here looking at this, you probably already know about this case. So I don't want to rehash everything, but they were found murdered uh, February 14th of 2017, um, a day after they went missing. So they went missing February 13th, 2017. The timeline, okay, when you look at cases like this or any, any unsolved case, you, you got to do a timeline, okay? When was the opportunity that they were killed? A timeline tells you a lot of things. Uh, it can it can start with uh, uh, witnesses, interviewing them. Where were they during this time? It eliminates suspects, timelines, help create a criminal profile, believe it or not. And the reason it does that is because you can tell a lot by a time of day, whether it was planned, whether it was unplanned, and we're going to get into that. Um, so... Am I, am I very confident about this assessment? Um, yes and no. And I, I want to qualify that by saying it's very difficult doing an assessment on this case because you don't know what the police know on this. Some older cases, okay, this is 2017, uh, let's say 1975, you've had 40 years for information to become available. And sometimes that those are a lot easier, even though they are a lot older. This one is very difficult. Again, you don't know what police know. Therefore, I wasn't able to research uh, that a lot. But from what I was able to research, from what was out there, and going off of the facts, I've come up with a pretty good conclusion of what I think uh, took place, which could help, obviously, eventually solved the case. So let's start off with the timeline. At 1.35, it appears that the victims were dropped off at this um, hiking trail, which had a very long bridge. And I want to say that I'm not an expert in this, okay? There's people that know every single thing there is about the case, just like John Bonet Ramsey case. I do not, and I don't claim to be, but I'm going off of the generalization of what I know. So at 135, they're dropped off. At 207, uh, Liberty posts a photo on uh, a social media, I believe it was Snapchat, of Abby on this bridge. It is a long, kind of worn down bridge, very deep uh, drop to the water or uh, at least uh, land down below of some sort. Very... Uh, dangerous type of bridge if you ask me uh by looking at the pictures but apparently all the kids and stuff went there and they hung out and it was known and people it was connected to a hiking trail so when you would come off of this hiking trail you would enter onto this bridge uh at 207 she posts this picture she was supposed to meet uh their father that was going to pick them up at 315 and they didn't show at 5.30, they're reported missing, and they are found the next day. So you have almost an hour gap, okay, at 2.07 in the afternoon to 3.15 when they didn't show. You can deduce, and you know I'm all about deducing. You know, you that's how you solve these cases. You, you start off with possibilities, and you deduce to probabilities. And somewhere in between, you end up finding your guy. So... I can deduce, you can deduce that between 207 and 315 is when this event occurred. That's a short window, so that's good for investigators. Uh, what happened? Were they killed during that time? We don't know, but we know something took place. 
most likely the abduction, and in my opinion, most likely murdered. Um, I forgot, I failed to mention, so it would have been Abby, or uh, Liberty German's sister, Kelsey, I believe is her name. She reached out to me probably a year, maybe two years ago, to help them with this case. And she had sent me a message via Twitter or Facebook, I'm not sure which, or might have even been my website. And I, yeah, absolutely, you know, free of charge. This is this is a heinous crime, okay? And I, I'll absolutely do whatever. I'm tell the investigators I'm here to help. And uh, I didn't hear back from her, so I don't know what happened with that but she had reached out to me and I wanted her to know that I was there to help and I'm still here to help anything that I can do so I want to look at the evidence there isn't a lot because we don't know a lot usually when you have evidence I include the body or in this case the bodies you don't have that um, you have the bodies of course but the autopsies are sealed I don't know what was found uh, we don't even know how they were murdered Okay, I started to, when I researched all cases, but specifically this case, you always want to go after police reports. We don't have that. Second best for me is newspaper. There was some of that. There was a lot of that. And that's what I went off of. I never go off of Reddit, crime boards, web sleuth boards. Half of that is bullshit. And I'm here to tell you right now, and you can disagree all you want. Um, I've had cases that were on it, and I can tell you a lot of it is lies. And why people do that, why they make up shit, is why it's just like why trolls are out there. They got nothing better to do with their life. So you have to be very cautious of what you read and take as fact. What I take as fact is press conferences when police are giving answers to the press's questions. Newspaper reports, uh, which have to be usually validated by an editor. So those are the things that I take in. I was able to look at some stuff and look at what evidence they had. And I could see that there was no autopsy done. So we don't know how they were murdered. But I broke from my mold a little bit. So because I was so intrigued about this case that I went to a website about the murders. And I, I, I didn't engulf myself in it. I, I just quickly looked at it. But something that caught my eye was two scanner audio clips. So I'm sure everybody knows or had of a scanner when police go to a scene. You know, a scanner can pick up radio communication. Um, as a drug cop, we are always aware of that because a lot of times our snitches would come in and say, "Hey, look." Uh, I was in buying uh, heroin from this guy. He has a police scanner, so he knows when you're coming if you have radio traffic. So I was always very cognizant of never putting anything on the rover as an undercover cop. If you are, know that. Never. Never. But anyhow, in this case, it, if, and big if, if this is legit, it sounded it, but I, I, I don't know. The scanner report from when they were looking for the victims, one of the investigators relayed and said, I found some evidence, send an evidence bag over here. And they said, what kind of evidence? And he said, girls undergarments under the bridge. That's big if it's related. And I'm sure it is, or he wouldn't have called it in. Um, it's possible it could have been old undergarments from somebody having sexual relations under the bridge or whatever. But I doubt it. If that's legit, there's a piece of evidence under the bridge, which means the assault happened there. But I, I, I find all that hard to believe. OK, so I'm not sure if that is legit or not. So I don't really want to comment on that too much. They also the investigator on a scanner report said there was a cigarette butt in the water. So. That seems significant. Okay, obviously, if he would have called it in uh, and requested an evidence bag, it being in the water um, close to the bodies where they were found seems to be significant. 
So what happened, okay, for those that don't know, these two girls were on this, the side of the bridge, at the beginning of the bridge. They are accosted there by an individual whom one of the victims captured on her cell phone. This is extremely important, and it also is extremely heroic, and it also tells you something about this crime, okay? Everyone probably has seen pictures of this guy, the way he's dressed, walking towards the victims, and they take a cell phone, and they record him coming. They only show a brief second clip of this, okay? The police released that, but there's a lot more. Trust me. So, why did they do that? Why did they feel the need to videotape this guy? It's important, okay? This guy made them feel threatened that they did this. And that is evidence, okay? We now know, hey, this guy is responsible. He's coming towards them. They feel threatened enough to record him. Uh, he's he's the guy, okay? So, so we have that. Eventually, they release audio from this video clip, the short video clip, where he says, guys, down the hill. That is evidence. That's very important evidence. Um, what can we tell by that short audio clip? Well, they released it, obviously, for somebody to recognize the voice. Nobody has done that so far that we know about. But if you listen to that audio, you can glean something from that. And I tell you what I gleaned. When he says guys down the hill, his emphasis on guys as if he's already told them once. And now he's telling them again, guys down the hill. It wasn't guys down the hill, guys down the hill. It was guys down the hill. Okay. So to me, he's already told them once to get down that hill. That hill is off of the foot of the bridge where they were accosted by this gentleman. And he's telling them to go down over this hill, which leads down a trail, across the creek to a place in the woods where their bodies were eventually found. About a half a mile from where they were accosted. So not a great distance. But that distance tells us a lot. It tells me a lot as an investigator. So what, what does it tell me? Okay, so we can start deducing some things from that. And one of the things is the crick. Much like the John Benet Ramsey video that I did where I felt that the pineapple being either partially eaten or not eaten at all found was significant very significant because i felt something happened during this pineapple getting ready or being eaten that it was something disturbed that i still feel that way in this case to me the creek is the biggest piece of evidence okay and you know you're saying well how the hell are you coming up with that Okay, where are you pulling that out of? You know, it's got to be the video and the audio. Yes, they are obviously probably the most important because people can uh, identify the suspect. Hopefully, at least that's what the hope is. But for me, the crick can tell, it tells you a lot. Okay, and I'm going to get into how important that is in a little bit. I got so many notes here that I'm bouncing around. But uh, I'm going to come back to why and how important that creek is to this case. Rumors, okay. In cases like this, famous cases, and I already discussed it, why some people lie or, or make up stuff. There is a lot of rumors. And some of them may have merit to it. Apparently, there was an abandoned barn or an abandoned type of building near where these bodies were found. Um, I looked at a map. I did see what people were talking about, but they weren't killed in that abandoned building. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell you why, 
is because you're not going to kill somebody in a nice secluded abandoned building and then drag them or carry them, two of them, away from that and spot being seen by somebody. The physical exertion that takes place to do that, it's unnecessary. You wouldn't do that. So they weren't killed in, in this abandoned barn. So you could dispel that rumor. They were killed exactly where they were found in those woods. Uh, leaked text messages. I've briefly seen something like a heading of something of leaked text. I didn't even read them. I didn't even get into that because it just seems so uh, fake. It could be legit. You don't know. But if you don't know, you can't you can't go off of that. Uh, there was also a picture that said there was a man hiding behind a tree and you could see it. Again, those are things that, man, just like at a Lisa Lamb case where you just start going down rabbit holes, okay, and start trying to nitpick because you can't, you your brain can't solve these things and you're trying to find any little piece of detail and it takes you away from the, the evidence where you should be looking. So... Dispel all those rumors, okay? None of that matters. Um, let's get back to the, the crick, okay? Was this a planned murder or was it unplanned? Let's talk about that, okay? This will lead us to the, the crick. You have to determine that. You have to determine whether it was planned or unplanned. And the reason you got to do that is because it will lead you to your offender. So there's been most people, I'm going to say 90% of the people would say that it was planned. And the reason for that is because the person had to know the location uh, and be familiar with the bridge the down over the hill to the trail. There's some people that said it was unplanned. Now I see both sides. The reason that I think, you know, I, I got it here. I wrote down why I thought both planned and unplanned. Um, unplanned. Okay, let's look at the time of day that this happened. We already established in the timeline it was between pretty much two o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon. Why, if it was planned by an experienced serial killer, would you plan to do this <clears throat> on an unseasonably <clears throat> warm day? And that weather is going to play an important part in this. I went back and looked at the weather for that, that day in, in Delphi, and it was 23 degrees early in the morning. It got all the way up to uh, 52 degrees. Okay, so in the afternoon, it was unseasonably warm that day. But why would a, an experienced serial, serial killer plan to do this when a lot of people are going to be on that trail? Nice day, finally. You know, we have all winter. Everybody is cooped up. They're cold. It's going to be 50 degrees. We're going to get out and we're going to hike. We're going to do things. So why would a planned person do this at 1.30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon when people are going to be there? That's one reason that I believe that it was unplanned or could be unplanned. Uh, number two reason unplanned, victims. You have two. Two victims. A lot harder to control two victims than just one. If you were planning this murder, would you not plan for a single alone female? Yes, you would. Why, why two? Okay. Two leads me to believe unplanned. Okay. Happened upon it. Circumstances are there. You're walking across this bridge, you're looking around. I don't see anybody. Two girls, two teenage girls, set the plan in motion and, and go. Or you wouldn't be setting the plan in motion. The plan would hit you. Obviously, it would have been something that he had fantasized about for a long time. And the opportunity presented itself. And he acted upon it. Now, we don't know how they were killed. 
We don't know if they were shot, if they were stabbed, if they were strangled. That would, if I knew that, that would take a lot of guesswork out of this equation. But we don't. Um, I do believe that they weren't shot. And the reason I believe that is because I did read an interview that the prosecutor at the time, he didn't prosecute this case, obviously, but he was in office at the time. I believe his name was Irvine gave where he he was giving a scenario where he said the killer left a couple signatures okay so a signature is something unique to that that killer that he does or did to those bodies that if he killed again or if he had killed again he had left those same signatures and you're able to link that so this prosecutor said i'll give you an example and he said something and i wrote it down here verbatim he was talking about a person that was being killed with a gun. And the way that he framed it, and again, I am picking this apart and I could be wrong, but the way he framed his response was as if these victims, Abby and Liberty, were not killed with a gun. He had made mention that he had been to other murders and prosecuted other murders, let's say, that were killed with a gun. And the way that he presented that made me believe that they were not killed with a gun. But I don't know that, and so I don't want to speculate. Um, I would say that this offender more than likely had a gun on him uh, or a knife, and the reason that I can deduce that is because he, he accosted them and took them to a different location. Okay. I don't think he would be able to do that without a weapon on his person. Um, but I'll get into that a little bit later too. Um, but we get back to the unplanned versus planned. Now, I gave you the reasons for an unplanned murder. The two victims... Uh, multiple victims is sometimes, but not always, indicative of an unplanned crime. The time of day. Now I want to talk about why it could be a planned murder. It could be because he knew the area. Okay, He had to know that railroad bridge. Somebody stumbling upon that from out of town. It's not a tourist destination from what I understand. Um, but let me tell you why I think that it was a planned murder or at least planned sexual assault. Let's start with that. What can you tell about the way the offender was dressed? Okay. He's wearing a blue jacket. A uh, gray hoodie underneath that jacket. A brown shirt appears to be tucked out. Kind of bulky. Okay. What what does that tell you? Anything? Let me tell you what it tells me. Go back to the weather for that day. 23 degrees in the morning. 52 degrees by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. When this happened. Look how he's dressed. He's still dressed. In cold weather gear. Okay. That tells me. More than likely. That this was an experienced. Killer. And he had been in that area. That park. Since the morning. Trolling. Now what is trolling? BTK killer described trolling great because he used to troll you're looking for victims okay that's what they do they call it trolling you're out looking okay perfect opportunity what, what am i looking for this guy by the way he was dressed i believe he was up since uh, the morning when it was in the 20s that's how he's dressed the victims are not dressed like that Okay, and the victims were dropped off there at one o'clock. So by that, we can deduce that it was already getting warm in the 50s. 
they had on the victims, I believe, from what I saw, and I could be wrong, and you can correct me, but at least the picture that was posted of Abby on Snapchat, um, she had a light jacket on. Look at this guy. He's bundled up to all belief. So to me, he had been out there and he's waiting for the opportunity to create a sexual assault or a murder. So what do I believe? Was it unplanned or planned? Well, I'm going to get into that. But I just gave you two different reasonings for why people believe it's planned and why, why it's unplanned. Okay, we went through the evidence. Um, the, the sketch. The sketch is part of the evidence. There's a little bit of confusion because two different sketches were released. One showed an older guy with a beret and a goatee. That was the initial one. And then sometime later, they released a different one. Now, why? Why is that? Well, I believe initially a witness was probably interviewed and said, hey, I've seen this guy coming from that bridge, from that area, and they put out that sketch right away. We want to talk to this guy. Uh, I believe that that's what happened. I could be wrong on that, but that's what I believe. And then later, through more interviews, more enhancements from the video, from the cell phone, from one of the victims, and probably the FBI criminal profiling unit, they created another sketch. And what was important about that second sketch, and I wrote it down, was that they said that the person should probably be between 18 and 40, but have a youthful appearance. That was key to me when I looked at a couple of the suspects. So let me talk about that suspect before I forget. This Recently, I believe there was a guy named James Chadwell that was arrested for kidnapping a nine-year-old girl and sexually assaulting her. And he must have been very close to the Delphi area. They showed a picture of him. He is like in his 40s. But when I looked at the picture, I was like, man, he looks like 18, 19, 20 years old. So when I seen that they had said he would have a youthful appearance, I was like, wow, okay. I'm not saying that's the guy. I have no idea. And I don't, I don't know the particulars of... Uh, if he's linked to this case at all, other than some news reports that I read. But I did see that picture and the youthful appearance quote did stick with me for him. And he, he did resemble the sketch to me, but, you know, that, does, that doesn't matter to me. I mean, we've seen in D.B. Cooper how everybody resembles a sketch. So uh, I don't get too caught up in that. Um. Let's get to my, my, bef no, before I get to my conclusion, let's say, I wrote down a couple of notes that I felt important. Just like every case that I go through, when I read the police reports, I read it the first time through like a story. And I've said this before, I just let it develop in my head like I'm reading a story. Second time through, things that, just a statement, something that doesn't feel right in my stomach, I jot down. That way, when you're done with everything, you go back to it. And that's where you start your investigation. So I did that. I wrote down some stuff here that I just felt was important. And I wanted to go through it. The half mile from the bridge uh, where the bodies were found, I wrote that down. I thought that was important because obviously uh, a half mile... It, is not that is not that far and it's certainly walking distance controlling two victims we'll get into to that on how he did that the picture of the suspect on the bridge the short video clip which they took a still from and made a photograph he has his hands in his pockets now why did i write that down i felt that odd because when i looked at photographs of that bridge in the spacing in between the planks. I felt that odd because to me, 
you almost want to keep your balance in a way in order to not fall. But he has his hands in his pockets walking across that plank. Does it mean anything? Maybe not. But to me, it struck out as his hands are cold, possibly, and he has them in there, or he's concealing something in his pocket. Uh, and I would surmise that it probably was the latter of the two, but it, sh it stood out to me. Uh, I wrote down warm day, but he's dressed heavy. Okay, we already went into that. Why he's, I felt that he was dressed so heavy. It appears to me, more than likely, and I don't know this, but I, I guarantee the cops know this, the investigators from that video, that the victim was shooting from her cell phone. Apparently, she had kept the video rolling and stuck it in her pocket. That's why I'm confident that the investigators know more than what they're, they're saying. I thought, and I wrote this down, that it's possible she recorded the entire sequence all the way up to their murders. Um, but I did watch a press conference or read transcripts from a press conference where that specific question was asked and the investigator said, no, the murders were and the assaults were not on that video. Could he be lying? Yes, it's possible. But I guess you would have to know that type of cell phone but if she was recording, and this is documented, that she was recording and stuck it in her pocket to conceal the video, but the audio and the video was still recording in her pocket, why would it stop until the battery ran out? Okay, so that, that's a question that I have, and I'm not sure if the investigators are holding that information back or not. Um, if it is, that's, that's chilling. Uh, but anyhow, I believe, this is my opinion, that the offender was following them at some point, walked past them, said something, stared at them, did something to make them feel uncomfortable. He went to the, all the way to the end of that bridge and started walking back towards them. That is when they took out the cell phone and was, and recorded him. Now, the only reason they did that is because he had done something that made them feel uncomfortable. It's the only reason, okay? So as the offender, why walk that whole length of that bridge or walk past them at least, maybe turn around on that bridge and come back towards them? That's what I believe happened. I have written down here, he didn't walk the same way back. I'm going to get into that. Um, to me, that means he's familiar with the area. It wasn't a robbery. The kids don't have anything. I've seen that somewhere. Okay. If it was a robbery, number one, they would have taken her cell phone. Big piece of evidence. He would have picked it up and said, oh, shit, I was recording me. You know, I'd take it. That didn't happen. So robbery is completely out of the the motive here. Um, again, the he, I I believe based off of the way he was dressed, uh, the way he said guys down the hill, he was becoming impatient. That's my belief of this offender. He was becoming impatient. Had been waiting around all day. For the perfect opportunity, probably, most likely waiting for a single lone female to come across, but there wasn't. There was couples. It was documented, you know, at least one couple was seen. You're not going to do that because the male is a threat. Uh, he's getting impatient. He finally sees the two girls. Not such a threat. They're younger. Okay, now I'm going to make my move. I have that written down. I have written down here, listen when talking to more than one person. And I have in quotation, guys. This is important to find out who this suspect is. Okay. He says, guys, down the hill. He doesn't say, girls, down the hill. He doesn't say, you too, down the hill. 
he specifically uses the word guys down the hill. So if somebody knows this offender, they have, he's going to have that uh, signature, you know, it's, he's going to have this way of speaking where he uses the term guys in his work environment. You know, let's say he's, he's a, uh, he's a construction worker. Okay. And he's working and he's trying to get a job done and the rest of the people are goofing off behind him or whatever and bothering him. He's going to turn around and say, guys, cut it out. That's key. Okay. Something small like that. Guys, remember that. Because when this offender is arrested, and I believe he will be arrested, people are going to come forward and they're going to say, how did I miss that? When I was at work with him, he would say, you know, guys, keep it down. So something small like that, remember. All right. What do I think happened? Let me get to my conclusion here. Again, very hard, very hard because I don't know everything the police know. And you never do sometimes, but in this case, it's even twofold. You don't even know how they were murdered. I don't know whether they were strangled. That tells me something about the suspect. I don't know whether they were shot. That tells you something about the suspect. It's not personal. It was uh, something else. Uh, so many things you can tell just by murder. But what do I know? I know where they were accosted from. They were marched a half a mile across the creek. To a location in the woods where their bodies were found. This was, in my opinion, based off of the evidence that I've seen taken into confact, the whether it was planned, unplanned, I believe planned, the way he was dressed, the victims, the cell phone recording, the location of the bodies, where they were accosted, the time of day, the weather. You take all of that, the totality of that, into consideration, I think this was a planned abduction with sexual assault being the motive. And he was leading them out of those woods. And something happened. What do I mean by that? Why cross the creek? Okay, if you know that area, which we've already deduced that we feel, at least I feel, that the offender did not happen upon this location. He knew the location. He knew that it was going to be a warm day, nice day. He's been out trolling, looking for a victim since early morning. He was becoming impatient. He finds two girls, don't offer that much of a th threat. He would rather it be one of them, but it's two of them. You know what? I'm impatient. I'm going to get this done. Nobody's around. I'm going, to, I'm going to, it's planned. I have this fantasy in my mind. I've been rehearsing it for years, months, who knows? I'm going to take it into effect. So he approaches them, says something as he passes them, looks at them weird. They start videotaping them. He, he pulls a gun on them, pulls a knife on them, something threatening, and says, guys, down the hill. He says it impatiently. One, because he's been there trolling all day, all morning. Two, he's already told them once, more than likely, and they didn't listen. So now the emphasis on guys, down the hill. They go down this hill. They walk. They cross a creek. Okay? This is paramount. Because if this guy knows the area, he knows that there's a creek there. Why, why cross that creek if you don't have to? Okay? You don't. You don't if you don't have to. Okay? You kill them before the creek. You're, let's say you're, you're, you have a gun on the victims. You have a knife on the, one of the victims and the other victim's going to listen. 
and you're leading them and you see that creek. I don't care whether it's ankle high or it's chest high. It doesn't matter. It's a creek. It's an obstacle. And you have no reason to cross that except to get to the other side. If he was not leading them out there, he would have killed them right there. He sees the creek and he says, you know what? Nah, I'm going to kill him right here. He only kills them, from what I understand, 50 feet from that creek. So it isn't like, okay, I'm on this side of the creek. I'm looking around. It's not secluded enough. I got to go to the other side of the creek where it's more secluded and wooded. I don't know that because I'm not there. But from the pictures that I saw, no. Kill him right there on this side of the creek. That way you don't have to cross the creek. You don't have to get wet. All this. The reason he crosses the creek is because he parked his car on that side of the creek. There's a cemetery there. He parked there and came in that way. And that's where he accosted them. That's the only reason to cross that creek. Think about it. So you're abducting these people, these victims, and you're going to cross that creek and take them to your car and take them to your home, which is probably within, you know, 10 mile radius of where that's at. But that's your plan. Something happens when you cross that creek. It, and let me say that a couple pictures that I saw, the creek, at least on, on the picture that I saw, had a bit of a bank to get up. Okay? So I can envision him leading them across the creek. They get up the creek. He slips or something, had a little bit of trouble getting up that bank. They started to run. And the, the, the fantasy, the plan is out of whack. I kill him there. And that's where it happens. He wasn't able to fulfill his plan of taking them to his vehicle, which was parked more than likely at that cemetery or around that area. That's the only reason. Guys, think about it. It's the only reason to cross the creek if it's a planned event. And we've determined it was planned. It was an unplanned event. Okay, well, he doesn't know that that creek's there. Um, you know, stuff like that. But we've already determined it's planned. If it's planned, he's more... There, that's the only reason to cross the creek. You're not going to want to get wet. I don't care that it's 52 degrees out. It's still chilly. Okay? And when you get wet, it's even worse. So, the only reason to cross that creek is to lead them somewhere. And it's my belief he had parked there and was leading them to a vehicle to abduct them. And something happened. They ran, most likely scenario, something where he killed them there. Were they sexually assaulted there? Big question. Because now his fantasy is messed up. So maybe there was not even a sexual assault, even though I believe firmly that the intent was a sexual assault. But once the offender's fantasy is ruined, him kidnapping them and taking them and chaining them up or doing what he planned to do with them, once that's ruined, does he go through with the fantasy? Sometimes, sometimes not. Um, I, the time of day, 1.30, nice day. I just, I have a hard time believing that he would sexually assault both of them in the woods after his fantasy was derailed. Uh, but, hey, I, I, I don't know any everything, you know? So that's my belief by looking at this with an unbiased set of eyes that I think most likely occurred. I would certainly want to know how they were murdered. I most certainly would want to know whether they were sexually assaulted, whether the undergarments that were found under the bridge, which leads me to believe that it wasn't related, but I have a hard time believing that if those that audio of that scanner was real, why it wouldn't be. Unless 
he threw the undergarments in the water and they floated down there. I, I don't know. I don't know the area that much. So I, I got written down here. My mind would change possibly in regards to the undergarments because of where they were found and if they related to one of the victims, if they were sexually assaulted there. Uh, I just think the totality of everything leads me to believe that he was going in, going to abduct them. And he certainly wanted to abduct only one, okay? If there had been a different lone female there, even if she was older, in her 20s or 30s, I believe the offender would have abducted her, taken her down that trail, across the creek, into the cemetery or the surrounding area where his vehicle was parked, and would have sexually assaulted, raped, kidnapped, killed. Um, but he was growing impatient, had been there all morning, which was evidenced by the amount of clothing that he was wearing, and his voice and guys down the hill tells me he was running out of patience, he was going to kill and abduct and assault somebody that day. It happened to be two girls Younger girls who didn't offer too much of a threat to him in his mind. Although apparently these girls were a lot braver than he thought. Because number one, they captured him on video and audio. Two, I believe they tried to run, uh, tried to fight back and something right on the other side of that creek bed. And more than likely he slipped coming up that creek bed or something that they were quick on the draw and started to run or whatever happened. I have a hard time believing they were shot. Um, I would think somebody would have reported gunfire in that area if that happened. So, you know, he would have, he would have caught them quick and more than likely, I, I hate to surmise this, but I would say that they would have been stabbed more than likely if it was a planned murder, okay, because you, you'd have a weapon of opportunity, okay? That's how you can tell planned or unplanned. You know the death. Let's say they were beaten about the head with a rock. You could say that is more than likely an unplanned event because if it was planned, the offender would have brought a weapon with him. He's not going to bring a rock, Right? He's going to bring a gun. He uses a rock because something happened that he wasn't expecting. An argument escalated, and I'm going to grab the closest object. That is an unplanned murder. We don't even know that here. So it's very, very hard to offer a accurate assessment of the case. I could tell so much and I could do so much more have I just known how they were murdered. So without that, this is the conclusion that I had come up with. Um, it was a planned sexual assault, kidnapping. He was leading them across that creek to get to his car to take them somewhere to assault them. He probably had restraints with him underneath his uh, heavy coat in the pocket something. I don't know whether they were restrained. We don't know that. I, I doubt that they were restrained at that point in time. It's easier to lead them out of an area unrestrained and just threatened with violence, a knife or a gun. So that's what I believe happened in this case. Uh, it was This is a tough one, and I, I think I'll probably come back to this later on and look at it. But break it down. Don't go off of innuendos, rumors. Go off of the facts. Simplify it. Look at certain things. How, you know, in this case, how the offender was dressed, the weather for that day, his voice on that brilliant recording and brave recording that those girls made. Uh, little things like body location. Why across that creek? Okay. That's that's huge to me. Okay. So that's what I believe 
happened in this case, if more evidence are to come to light, I would maybe change my opinion on this on certain things. But again, with what I've worked with, this is the way it is. And if uh, Kelsey German, uh, you had reached out to me a couple years ago, and I, I am so sorry for your loss. And again, if you want my help, uh, all you have to do is ask, okay? I'm always available, and I'll do whatever I can to help you. And that goes for all family members and victims in cold cases. You know, you have to be passionate. I don't care what vocation you're in. I don't care if you're a doctor. Anybody go to the doctor's office? I know you have. And it felt like you're just being pushed through. You know, they don't care. You're just a number. They see so many patients a day. You know, it's heartbreaking. And then you find that one doctor, that one chiropractor that sits down and listens to you. And when you talk to them, you can feel their passion for their job and they're wanting to help you, okay? That's the doctor I want. That's the chiropractor I want. You know, that's the way I am, okay? I want to help. It's in my DNA. It's in my blood, okay? It, it, it's why I created ASOC, you know, and had all those great cold case investigators you know, Henry Lee, Joe Kenda, and the criminal profiling, because I thought it was so very important to be able to look at a crime from different lenses. We've been force-fed that, okay, a detective back in the 50s, that's how you look at a case. And then DNA comes around, and now it's a forensic. You know, you have to look at a case through a forensic. And then it was psychology. You got to know the criminal profiling. No, you need all of that. Okay, you need someone that's educated in all of that and to look at it through different lenses, okay? What does a criminal profiler see? And why does he say those things? What does a DNA expert see based off of the evidence? And why do they say that? What does the old school detective see? That's what I do. I take all of those, you know? That's why I have my master's degree and stuff in criminal profiling and was a detective for 15 years and started my own DNA lab with uh, Susanna Ryan from ASOC. Because there needs to be somebody who is well-versed in all of those lenses in order to put together a crime scene assessment of what happened. It's so important. So I just have the passion to do it. And I, and I, I love it. I just, oh, anyhow, I get fired up when I talk about this because it's so important, you know, it's so important to get the facts, to have the passion, to put it all together and to help. And for those investigators that are so arrogant and so, I, I they, they, don't, they don't want help from anybody. I, that just infuriates me. Because um, when I was on the job and I was looking at cases, I sought out help from everybody. I don't care if it was a, a housewife from Minnesota. She could see something that I missed. I want her to tell me, what did you see? Or a professional like Henry Lee and everything in between. So if you're an investigator, don't think and don't be so arrogant to think that you can't get help from somebody else. Because you can. That's how cases are solved. Okay? We all have to work together. So, Delphi Murders, that's my rant. That's my assessment. And take it for what it's worth. And hopefully this helps somebody. And I hope, you know, people listening to this, it brings up something. And they're like, I heard this guy say guys all the time at my work. And he calls the tip line. And this case is solved and I, it's just my hope that all cold cases are solved but I want this one solved as soon as possible and I, I, I'll probably do an update to this case after I look into it further because there's just so much stuff that intrigues me on it Delphi Murders all right guys thank you so much for watching I would say like subscribe but I don't care about any of that shit just watch enjoy and hopefully this helps solve a murder.
mains out. So today what I want to do is take some time to go over some video comments on the Delphi murders. Uh, just because there's some really great questions and comments, but I haven't been able to answer every one of them. Um, there's just too many. If, uh, However, if you are a elite member of my Cool Case uh, member club, whatever it's called, I do answer. So if you're a member, if you're an elite member of that, I will go through all those comments, find yours, and answer your questions all the time. So just remember that going forward. But in here, I want to go through some of these comments, much like John Bonet, but I'm not going to harp on the trolls like I did that first time. Uh, they're not worth my time. So let's start. Uh, what is a crick? Haha. Uh -huh. So I've seen this a lot. I guess from when you're from Pennsylvania, I say crick, not creek. Never noticed it, I guess, until I got all those comments. Crick, creek, tomato, tomato, it's all the same. Next one, James Chadwell did it. I did mention in, in my video, I think, about this, how uh, I thought he was a, a good suspect for uh, various reasons, but... Um, I can't, I can't say James Chadwell did it. There's no evidence to that. If you want to be that type of person to accuse somebody, um, I mean, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but I will never do that until I see evidence. So that's my answer on that. Um, let's see, let's go down here some. I think Bridge Guy was at the cemetery paying respects to maybe an ex-wife or mother since the murders happened a day before Valentine's Day. Maybe went for a walk afterwards. That's that's pretty good. Uh, but again, if you remember, I believe that this was planned. So is it possible that he went to the cemetery first? Uh, yeah. So I would think that that is a great that was that's from Patrick Starr. I think that's a very good place to start, uh, for sure, especially when you throw in Valentine's Day in the mix. Uh, I like his, uh, his way of thinking there. So, again, I don't think it was a spur-of-the-moment decision that you're going to go and uh, slaughter, you know, two people. I think it was planned, but the cemetery would be a good place to start and uh, maybe work backwards from there. So, good job on that, Patrick. Let's see. Guy B, the younger looking sketch was actually made first. They just only released the second sketch at first. The later release, the first sketch they made. Okay, yeah. Appalling intro music. <laughs> Yeah, well, bye. George, experienced serial killer, question mark. I think that that is very possible. Um, I think, you know, there's two ways to think about this. That he was very disorganized offender, and therefore, because think about this. What experienced serial offender would murder two most likely with a knife during the daylight where people are around again that it takes me back to something went wrong and i and, and that creek being a barrier an obstacle he was leading them out and they made a break for it. And maybe they ran across the creek up the bank. And that's how they lost the shoe. And, and I mean, all those, you know, I, I'd be a fool if I sat here and said I know for sure. But what I do know for sure, that is, and that's what you got to look at, the facts. What I do know for sure is that creek, creek, is an obstacle. It's a barrier 
that to me, an experienced, organized offender would not want to deal with unless they had to. So again, I just, I don't feel that, I don't feel that it was planned to take place there. It's, it's too risky. But then again, I, I wasn't there. I haven't stood there. This is just from like maybe aerial maps. I, I haven't watched videos. I don't watch videos on YouTube about these cases. You know, I go to police reports and if there aren't any police reports, trial transcripts, if there's not trial transcripts, um, news reports and stuff like that. Cause I don't go on conjecture. I want, I want facts. And what I saw was an obstacle that the offender had to overcome. Whether, whether, and somebody made a good point and I hope I get to it, but they had said, well, wouldn't the offender have to cross the creek if he parked at the cemetery, abduct them and go back over the creek? Doesn't that kind of seem uh, counterintuitive to what I'm saying? And that is very true. But what I don't know about the creek is, was there a low spot, a place where you could cross, where you didn't get your feet wet, um, which wasn't hard to navigate around. From where the only picture that I saw of the bank was very high and steep and muddy. And by looking at that, you know, my assessment is he doesn't want to go up that. Is that where they tried to make their escape, you know, before the creek and run across the creek? I don't know. There's just too many unknowns in this case. It's not like uh, John Benet Ramsey or West Memphis 3, where almost everything is out there, especially with West Memphis 3, because there was a trial. So you have pretty much all the evidence. This, you don't know nothing. I seen a thing on here. They said, I can't believe they didn't do an autopsy. You're wrong. Listen, I didn't mean they didn't do an autopsy. What I said was they didn't release the autopsy. Meaning we don't know how, what the manner of death is, okay? I mean, obviously it's homicide, but how? Strangulation, gunshot, knife, and everybody likes to speculate, but nobody knows for sure except for the people there and probably the family. <sighs> Maker in motion. I know the police keeping secret helps the case because they have information only the killer would know. But after four years, time to open up a bit. This card's close to the best strategy is going nowhere. Hey, I've had this fight with law enforcement even when I was on the job as a detective. You have to keep some things, okay? But I'm with you. After time goes, yes, you release more, no doubt. Dustin Nolan, why was there no autopsy done on the bodies? I don't understand that at all. Dustin, that's not what, what I meant. I meant they didn't release the autopsy results to the public. Uh, crypto Zoo, I hike a lot and have seen many underwear in the woods or off trails. Okay, uh, I'm going to take your word for that. But what I was getting at in there was that came across a scanner report. And I didn't know whether it was related or not to this case. Please, please look into who was parked at the cemetery all night. It was a pickup truck. There's documentation and photographic evidence. This is from Danielle. Hey, I I'm sure the police are all over that. Okay. And whether it was a dead end or they're still following up. I'm not bringing anything new by saying anything about the cemetery, I am sure. <coughs> Excuse me. I feel that his hands are in his pockets because he's familiar with the Monon High Bridge. He has been there before. I truly believe that bridge guy is a resident of Delphi or the nearby area. And it's possible. You know, absolutely. But you can't say 100%, that's for sure. 
You'll never know the name of the Zodiac. That's from Cal 420. Probably right. Hey, Ken, just a thought I have. Would FBI have the ability to track all cell phones paying off the towers that were in the same proximity of the victims then do a cross-elimination of the suspects? That's a good question. I think uh, I could probably, you know, do that. That's a lot of a lot of records to go through. Um, but I'm sure for these little girls, they're going to do that or have done that or can do that. Okay. How did they pass away? Again, I don't know that. Apparently, the case is being featured in Netflix Unsolved Mysteries Volume 3. That's being filmed right now. That, that's great. Shannon, I really like Henry Lee. I bought his book. I really like Henry Lee also. Bundy successfully, successfully planned and preyed on women in the daytime, but I think it was opportunity. They were just in the wrong place, like a trap door spider waiting for someone to come along. I would, I would almost tend to agree with that. He, like I said before, it's my opinion. This more than likely was a serial killer. And listen, I don't know. I don't jump on that serial killer bandwagon. Everybody in the world, whenever there's a murder, it's a serial killer. When 90% of them know who the offender is, and maybe out of that, half of them are domestic incidents. <laughs> so it's not always a serial killer. However, in this case, it appears to me that he was trolling. And like I said before, trolling is you're out looking around, waiting, you know, for the right opportunity. Again, the way he was dressed intrigued me because it was in a, I just did a case. What was the temperature in Delphi that day? It was uh, like 50. Half of everybody says, oh, that's freezing. That's why he's dressed like that. The other half says that's unseasonably warm. I just did a case, the staircase, Michael Peterson. It was 50 degrees. I think it was even got down to 41 degrees. He's wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and he says he's outside for two hours drinking, and people are like, I can't believe that you would make a big deal about that. That's no big deal. Are you kidding me? 41 degrees in shorts and a t-shirt for two hours? Yeah, that's cold. There are some people that will do that. Everybody knows that crazy person. It's 20 degrees out and he's always wearing shorts and flip-flops. You know, we all know that person. But that's where suspectology comes in. Okay, let's look at an old photograph history of Michael Peterson and see if he's wearing shorts at Christmas and so on and so forth. So that's my point on this. Um, to me, he was dressed that way because he was colder in the morning and he's been out all day looking for a victim until he finally struck. <sighs> Chadwell fits the profile. Looks like him. Lived in the area. I could go on just saying. I agree with you. Do you think they were taken across the creek and on because it would be sure no one could see them or was it that he felt more comfortable on that property? Oh, I didn't know there was a cemetery in that direction. Oh, that's from Kara Williamson. I think I covered that. Here, Joseph Dale. 50 plus degrees isn't exactly warm weather. It's just unseasonably warm. It's still cold as with the wind. I agree. I agree. But you look at the differences between how the bridge guy is dressed compared to how the victims are dressed. Big difference, right? Now, you can speculate all day why he's dressed like that. He's hiding things in his coat. Possible. I, you know, I don't know that. My theory is that he's been up since the morning when it was a lot colder than 50 degrees. Uh, so... Katie Kircher, I think from his use of guys down the hill that the perp is a teacher or a coach. I heard that a lot, and really, that that's great, to, but it's that is pure speculation, you know. Much like me saying that 
What I've learned, I guess, is that this, that sentence has been spliced. It's from two different sections of video or audio. That makes me think differently, but originally I had said, to me, he feels impatient. Like I've already told you once, guys, down the hill. That's the tone that I got from that. Now, if they're saying that it's spliced, it's two different sections, okay. Well, that changes my thought process a little bit. Then maybe that's not the tone that he was coming off with. So there's so many variables to this. Um, and it's hard when you don't have all the information, as you guys know. Man, there's so many. Uh, th You're so handsome. Love your eyes. They smile. <laughs> I like that comment. All right. But I digress. This is this is uh, Delphi murders here. We're not we're not talking about my my handsomeness. It was opportunity, yes. He crossed the creek into heavier brush to keep out of eyesight from the bridge from others who may happen to walk across it. Okay, that's possible. Oh, this guy may be a lot of things. Gentleman is not one of them. Apparently in the video, I referred to this bridge guy as the gentleman and a lot of people said they took offense to that and rightfully so if that gentleman is responsible for these heinous murders i would have a lot more adjectives to describe him and gentleman would not be a word that i would use uh know that Why are you on a green screen? Why do, you, why do you ask stupid questions? There's no green screen. This is, there's a green screen. Could I take a book off the shelf? <sighs> Full Metal Atheist at 1102. Wait, there was no autopsy done? I highly doubt that. Perhaps you meant not released publicly. That's exactly what I meant. <sighs> Good video. I'm curious. Have you ever actually solved any actual cold cases in your official work with police? Yes, I have. I really, really loved your work, but your intro song is too long and so hard to listen to. Your content, though, is so incredible. Your insight and analyst is humbling. My love is back to Lawnmower and Scrooge. Thank you for your education. Well, thank you, Carrie. Did you hear the police message to offender where they said, we know that you have seen or watched the shack? What is the relevance of that? I've never seen it, read it. How would they know that? Something he did, a receipt found, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't see I didn't see the press conference of any of those. I did watch the shack. I vaguely remember it. I'd be curious if any of you guys know the answer to that question. What what are they talking about in reference reference to the shack? Um I'm curious to that answer. Okay, is it creek or crick? I don't know. I don't believe cops keeping stuff secret is tremendous. This is an active serial killer on the loose. Serial killers are caught by escaped victims and effectively that the their case we here with this video. I don't understand that. You know the Zodiac Killer were two people, a male and a female. The female was a predator who was abused as a child. That's game. We're not talking about the Zodiac. This is Delphi. Ken Maines, Libby would have loved talking to you. Solving crimes was her passion too. Well, I, I would have 
love talking to her about it, no doubt. Fantastic analysis. Well, thank you. I didn't think there was anything fantastic about it, but I appreciate it. Daniel, my question is, if they felt threatened by him, why didn't they call the police? I think they knew him and caught him off guard, or why didn't they hurry off? He put them at ease, I believe. I think they knew each other. That's not necessarily the case. How, how long do you got... I mean, first of all, do you really think that these victims thought that they were going to be murdered because some guy is giving the heebie-jeebies? I mean, how many times have you gone somewhere and said, man, that guy's creepy? You don't expect to be murdered, so why are they going to call the police? You know, and things happen in a split second. It takes a split second for that guy to take his hands out of his pocket, reach into his coat, pull out a gun, and say, down the hill, now. You're, you're shocked. You're scared. You don't know what's going on. You you comply. What are you going to do? Take out your phone and dial police and risk getting shot? No. So that that's why. I heard either a reporter or law enforcement say that the phone wasn't found with the bodies. He said no, but indicated that it wasn't far away. Possibly the girl who had it had the phone was thinking to ditch it because she knew it was evidence. I don't really understand the question, but other than the phone wasn't found with the bodies, um, again, I, we don't know. I saw an interview that Lib Libby was online and met a boy. Could have been this man catfish. She was going to meet him at the bridge at a certain time. Abby said, you're not going alone. I'll go with you. I think they took the pick of a man because that's not who they expected to be there. It was supposed to be a young boy her age. Thoughts. Chris Blaylock. Well, Chris, I mean, I would certainly have thoughts on that if that was confirmed. The thing is, there's so many rumors out there that you can't speculate on them. Could that have been possible? You know, they're chatting online and think it's somebody and somebody else, a predator shows up? Absolutely. It happens all the time. But until I know that that's what happened for sure, I'm not going to speculate on that. Life is poetry. I personally believe Abby and Libby walked past the guy on their way to the bridge. They thought he was just an ordinary guy on an ordinary day. He then slowly started following them, knowing someone dropped them off. He took an awful big chance. He knew they were dropped off and seen the car leave or something. That's what happened. You... See, I was with you until the end. That's what happened, exclamation point. You don't know that. Are you, unless you're the killer. That's the only way you would know that. That's the problem sometimes is people think that they know when they're, when they're just completely speculating. Now, am, am I speculating? No. I mean, on some things about the way he's dressed, but I'm based off evidence. Uh, this is just saying what you feel, I guess, and, and you had that opinion, but you can't say that's what happened. Fact. Because that's just false. Unless you're the killer. Jeff, I hope this gets solved soon, especially if it turns out to be a local man. Yes, we all hope that it gets uh, solved soon. <coughs> Sorry. Also, when there's signatures involved in the killings, the killer meant to kill them in the woods. I believe he deliberately planned to kill them in the woods and not take them somewhere else. That is possibility. That's not what I think, but I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. I know, I know it's hard to believe, but it's, it's true. It's true. 
Kay Graham, an experienced killer, I believe. The person who done this didn't start with killing two people. He's done it before, somewhere, sometime. Yeah, I mean, I... I tend to believe that, but like I said before, and the reason I believe that is you don't take when you're... If it's your first murder, see, every murder that a serial killer does, the first one, okay, is always in their comfort zone, and more than likely, they knew him. Uh, I followed this up extensively with the Zodiac case with his first victim. Um, I believed that the killer knew her. Now, in this case, if you, you, I have a hard time believing that they would choose two victims as your first kill, okay? And I went into detail, I think, about this in my original video. So, I mean, you can, you can look it up there. My thoughts haven't changed on that. So, but again, I, I don't think that he intended to kill them there in the woods. To me, I believe that he was going to abduct them, but boy, see, I have a hard problem when I sit here and think about that, because isn't that just as difficult? You know what I mean? To, to kidnap two people instead of one? Is it possible that the offender, somehow the two victims split up for you know, maybe a minute or something was around the corner and the offender thought one, one girl right there alone. That's my target. That's what I'm getting. And when he approached her to begin the assault or begin the abduction, oh crap, there's another one. Now I got two and I got to deal with two. And if it is a sexual fantasy, the plan begins to unravel. Right? Right then and there. And then he becomes frustrated, frustrated, frustrated and flustered. And things go haywire, especially if they start to run. And I believe that based off the, the little bit of evidence that I've seen about the shoe being on one side of the creek, bodies found on the other side, I do believe that they tried to make a run for it. Um, that, that's what the evidence tells me there. But man, boy, this is such a such a tough case. It really is. It makes you makes you think and go through a million different scenarios, especially whether he it was planned or unplanned, um, whether he was an organized offender or disorganized offender. And I went through all this in the first video, so I, I don't want to rehash it. Boy. Think of it this way. What if he had done this before? What if he's abducted girls before? Okay. And everything gone smooth. Three different girls he's abducted before. They're all changed, chained in his basement. Now he says... I can do two. I can get two of them. Say possible. That's probably not probable. Why? Why two of them? At the same time. Boy. It makes you makes you think. You know, I. Originally, I said he planned on abducting them, and I based that mostly off of the way he was dressed in that creek, and that being an obstacle to overcome, because I couldn't see him killing two people in the woods if he was an inexperienced. Well, let's say he's an inexperienced person, but still planned. Maybe he didn't plan to abduct them. Maybe he planned on just uh, 
I'd say if he planned on killing them right then and there, then he certainly would have been familiar with the area because he would have known to have to take them far from the bridge or wherever he accosted them. And I said before, he probably lives within 10, 15 miles of that area. I still believe that. I still believe that. This is what I love about cases like this. Not that I love two people getting brutally murdered and affecting as many people as it has, but just the mystery about it and being able to sit here and talk to you about it while, because every time I talk about it, my head starts spinning. I start thinking of different scenarios and why, and I'm able to talk that out with you guys, which is really the best part of all this. But I, it doesn't change that it was a planned event to me. I just, I think it was, it was definitely planned. And I base that on my experience and training and, and observation, crime scene assessments, although I, we haven't seen the crime scene. So that could change everything. You know, I haven't gone through all these questions. I mean, there's thousands on them, 4,000 comments or whatever it is. But I remember seeing some of them about their throats were cut. And I don't want to comment on that because, I, you know, people say, well, he, I heard it from an EMT that was there. I heard it. And they wore scarves around their necks and stuff. Um, that doesn't mean their throat was cut. They could have been strangled so hard that it left so much bruising that makeup couldn't cover it up. And so they put a scarf around that. So I don't, I don't want to speculate on that. And I don't think it does anybody any good to do that. One of many questions I have is if they had access to the phones, why didn't they call 911 or a parent? I already told you that. Kevin Charles, even if his hands are in his pockets, he's looking down. I would say that that just means that he's a coordinated individual. I, I think, okay. I'm pretty sure that down the hill clip came out first and the guy's part came out later. So maybe they're not from the same sense. Could the person have lured the girls to the trail under the guise of a young teen boy? Yes, that certainly is possible. If it isn't already, you should upload these podcasts to Spotify. I had 1,000% listen to them while I drive. I believe uh, I, these are our own Spotify and iHeart and iTunes and all that stuff. Um... To the undercover man, I guess that's me. Please watch Paranormal Nightmares, Chasing Evil, Delphi Murders. This adds proof to your thoughts. MN, you are the second profiler that has surmised that the killer escaped through the cemetery. Correction, I am not a profiler. I never claim to be a profiler. Okay? Criminal profiling is just a tool... Uh, in my toolbox that I have experience and training in, but I would never say that I'm a, a criminal profiler. Scott, they were butchered, literally. This was not a sexual assault. There is no DNA. My guesses include that he is a union worker, iron worker. He knew this town, but it could have been stopping point for food and gas several times in the past. He must have known the kids were off school. I guarantee he has seen the movie The Town That Dreaded Sundown. You're over my head on all that, buddy. I don't know what you mean. Serene, when he says guys, to me means he knows the girls. Why did Libby record? She records because she knows this man. I think the exact opposite. She fears this man is well known. Friends with police and the community. Police are in denial. This man knew they were going to be there. I disagree with you. I don't think they knew him. Uh, let's see. My question, we'll never know, but why didn't those girls run sooner? I am in my 40s now, but when I was at that age, I saw some guy coming towards me like that. I could have run a long way before he crossed the bridge. It's just like Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. OK, 
Okay, you know what that means? It means you go into a fight um, and you're going to jab, you're going to do this, keep a distance, keep a distance. And everybody has this game plan until they get punched in the mouth. And then it's all one. It's all different. You don't know. You like to say that that's what you've done. This, these girls, you have no idea what they, maybe they did run sooner. Or maybe the guy wasn't threatening until he came up behind them and put a gun to their head. And so they didn't have a chance to run. So you can't say that. Also, crossing the creek will remove the possibility of search dogs following their scent once entered the water. Dog cannot follow. That's not true. Um, although it can mess around with the scent, they would pick the scent back up on the other side of the creek. Ex-prosecutor said in an interview the crime scene was odd. He also mentioned three signatures. I would, I'm very curious. Of all of this, that's the most curious I'm about, is three signatures. Um, I'd like to know what, he's, what he means by that, okay? I mean, obviously I know what a signature is. Um, but three different signatures? I've never heard of that before. <sighs> Has anyone ever thought it might be a close person to the girls, like someone may be connected to the family or in the family? Hey, it's possible. Anything's possible. He might have had a boat. <laughs> to me, it only makes sense that the evidence was placed there on purpose. And I have a hard time believing that crossing the creek, that one of the girls couldn't get away unless there was more than one person involved. Maybe. Just an FYI, you use the word guys a lot too. So it's hard to determine a killer by the little things. Just saying. Very true. It's, you're very true there. You guys are true. Uh, my grandfather always said it was the scumbags no one likes and the ones without conscience that work in the DEA or drug units. But you seem likable. <laughs> Um, Susan, I'm not likable. I don't think law enforcement knows a whole lot more. As you say, it's been five years. That being said, I hope to catch the coward scumbag. Yes, we do too. Uh, if all you look at are police reports Presser transcripts and newspapers, aren't you only seeing the bare minimum that the public can know? It isn't really thorough or investigative research, no offense. In my opinion, people looking into this case should read up on the dynamics between the families and the local criminals and law enforcement. I think there's a real possibility this was a targeted attack. This is from Meb. No, um... So let me explain why I look at transcripts, newspapers, and such. Because you could get on there and you could get on a web forum and you read that one of the victims was found hanging from a tree. So then all of a sudden, everyone starts going down that route. And that rumor gets spread when it's not true. Now, if I go to a court transcript or I go to an interview that the family give, they're not going to say that of an inaccurate um, event like one of the victims was hung from a tree, right? Trolls and rumors, they would say that. And they have said that time and time again. Now, why? Why does somebody kill two innocent people? Okay. You, you, can't, you can't go off of those things because then you start going down rabbit holes that have absolutely no bearing on the facts of the case. 
I understand it's frustrating because there are limited facts from this case, but that's all you can go on. You can't go on anything else. And if you do, you're foolish. You're unprofessional. You're an, you're an amateur. Okay. If you want to believe those rumors and then follow those rumors down a hundred rabbit holes, then be my guest. Go, I mean, that's up to you. But all you're doing is you're playing into that false narrative that we're trying to get away from. I agree that this was his plan, was to take the girls across the creek, up the hill, and load them into his car. He would prefer to take them to his place where he'd be able to take them to the time and assault them in a public place. And then I agree with that. The only caveat to that is why two of them, okay? Now, it could possibly be that he was there, maybe, to meet one of them, like other people have suggested off of the internet, and two of them showed up. So then you say, well, why would, wouldn't he just abandon his plan? Maybe this sexual fantasy has festered in his mind for months, maybe even years. And he's there, and he's going to... He's going to put it into action no matter what. And it happened to be two of them. It's, that is very possible. See, the thing is, people want me and other people, but I, know, I don't speak for other people. People want me to say exactly what happened. And you can't. Nobody can. Except for the killer. Okay? And then until he gets a hold of me, I, I can't tell you exactly what happened. You know? If you need an answer like that, then go see a, a, a psychic and they will feed you bullshit, okay? Because that's all it is. They don't know either. But some people just have to know exactly how. And I would never say that unless I knew 100%. Hey, what was that other comment that I had that uh, I, don't, I don't even remember? And I don't want to get into it because it was a troll. Uh... Somebody said that their father was the guy responsible. They were told to contact the FBI. Damn, if Libby's phone recorded the audio of the assault, it could explain why the officers working this case are so angry and determined to catch this guy. It's very possible. Oh, there's just so many comments here. I wonder how many perpetrators of these cold cases watch your analysts of the crime. Hope they get very afraid and someone recognizes who they are and has the guts to report them. Very knowledgeable, but had a hard time following as his thoughts jumped around a lot and seemed nervous. <laughs> Diane, I promise you I'm not nervous. Uh, but I will say that my thoughts do jump around a lot because when I start talking, my creative wheels start spinning and I start thinking, wow, well, well, this could be, this could be, um, this is very uh, therapeutic in a way because when you're not talking out loud and you're just sitting there and you're thinking about things, um, sometimes it doesn't flow as naturally as it does as when you're talking so this helps me helps me think and so i jump around a lot could he have tracked their snapchat or is he just there wrong place wrong time i don't know i would be interested to know if the murder location is close to a truck 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 stop his clothes look like a trucker to me and that's why nobody knows him he's not local just my thoughts jamie moore hey that's very good thought jamie uh, absolutely uh, could be. Scott, dude isn't 18 or 28, like 35 to 60, because he walks like he has sore feet. He definitely has had surgery. I believe because he was appears to drag his feet somewhat. I'm 6'3", and guys was the slang of our generation, whether it was girls talking 
The girls are guys yelling to girls. I don't hear the impatience you speak of, but I hear a guy who could have been a softball coach or science teacher who is simply directing them down the hill. I'm with you on the second half. The first part when you say dude isn't 18 or 28, like 36 to 60 because he walks like he has sore feet. Off of that one little clip, if you could get that, that he's had surgery before, you, know, you should be a world-renowned detective getting paid lots of money uh, because you're probably the only person that could honestly see that and know for sure that he's had surgery. But good attempt. I, I get what you're saying, buddy. I'm not meaning to rag on you. Love this. You should add the pictures into the video when you mention them too. Just thoughts I'd share. Uh, I used to do videos or pictures in my videos. I just do everything live because I'm not, I don't, it's just the way I do things. This is, this is me. Take it or leave it. It was the grandfather. Why would they record him if they were scared and not run away when they had the chance? They knew him. They were actually recording Gramps crossing the bridge waiting for him. No answer. Cynthia Gibson, spot on. Thanks, Cynthia. Have you ever met our hometown hero detective, Chris Anderson? No, I have not. Uh, Creek, not Crick. The Chadwell person's voice, the pitch and the timber are a match. I couldn't agree more. From what I understand, he lived in a tent in the woods and a Facebook page with a lot of pictures of the bridges on them. And I gave my opinion on, on that guy in the first video. So I'll do a couple more here and we're going to call this a day. I wish Joe Kenda could have been on the investigation of the John Bonet Ramsey case. Uh, we're talking about Delphi here. Somebody else saying, using the word guys can actually come across as friendly word also, just as if he knew them. But yeah, so that's possible. Okay, Robert Campbell, on your theory about what happened, didn't at one time the police use the phrase multiple signatures? So under your theory, would you think it would it would something post-mortem like the staging of their bodies? That would be interesting if he took the time to do that after things went wrong. That would indicate one cool character. Robert, that's the best comment that I've read so far. You're, you're absolutely right. That's why I would love to know what those signatures are. Because if he did pose the bodies, um, you are absolutely looking at an organized offender that planned this, without a doubt. Um, if we knew that, boy, then we could start deducing other things and saying, well, okay, we can get rid of that theory because that doesn't fit this and that and focus on that. So, I, yes, you're right thousand percent correct and I would love to know the answer to what those signatures are death kiss black heart never mind this video they will never catch the people who killed the girls and that is the saddest part of the whole nightmare I hope the girls rest in peace <coughs> excuse me oh and then I got something some guy named Gray Hughes or something, who's an expert, supposedly, in this case. Uh, he had sent me an email saying that I got a bunch of stuff wrong and inaccurate. And he commented a ton of stuff on here. And I was like, well, oh, okay. And he says, you can delete that stuff. And I said, why would I delete? I don't delete comments unless it's... Um, you know, very rude, or very ignorant, or something along that line. Well, then I ended up going in to delete him because he had made a video where he, you know, talked very poorly, I guess, about me. But I didn't, people sent me links or something. I didn't watch it because 
A successful person doesn't concern himself with the acts of others. I don't care what other people do, you know. I stay in my lane and do my thing. Everybody else, I don't I don't care about. So um He planned nice day, good weather. Live in Indian, we heard both were decapitated. Don't know if it's true, but he planned, and I don't think it was his first kill. Again, that's just speculation. Had to know the kids were out of school. He was not working. Decided to go hunting. Came across two kids out in the wilderness, so he pounced. He has probably struck out a few times looking for his prey previously. Some of that I agree with. You know, I think I discovered that in the first video. Um, had to know the kids were out of school. You know, that's very, uh, a lot of people commented on that. And I think there's some truth to that. Um, and I'm sure that's something that the police, you know, looked up to or looked into. But I wouldn't say that that's necessarily true. Wouldn't people be on that trail? Even if kids weren't out of school, he might not have been targeting kids. You know, we don't know that if it was planned, which I believe it was. Um, he simply could have went there looking for a victim and kids were there. I mean, young adults, older adults, don't they use that trail too? So I, I would say that he wouldn't have to know that school's out. So, all right. I think let's do one more here. Let me find one. Brilliant man. Uh, we won't end on that one. <laughs> uh, I hate hearing perpetrator refer to as gentleman. I get that. I understand. That's my fault. I'm just, I'm always very courteous and polite. And then when talking about that guy, I said gentleman. Sorry for that. Find a good one here to end on. All right, let's do. Uh, there's some in here, but I don't want to end on them. I'm going to try to find a good question that I can answer. That's the whole goal of this. It's not so much the comments it's the questions all right we'll end on this one hey detective i am a retired 28 year police veteran state trooper and elected sheriff is it possible to use james brian chadwell's photo while transposing similar clothing of bridge guy and place this combination electronically on bridge to gain further insight on identifying. There is a personal photo of Chadwell standing with hands in his pocket, much like Bridge Guy. Just an idea. Much love, Scott. Well, Scott, I would say, you know, I've done a lot of work on Billy the Kid, um, Johnny Ringo, a lot of Old West stuff, especially like trying to, uh, when people try to authenticate photos, especially of Billy the Kid. All that facial recognition stuff to me is basically bullshit. And just like composite sketches for the most part, you can make it look any way that you want it to look. And when you start transposing, and I've seen this done thousands of times, okay, not thousands, hundreds of times, transposing a known photograph of somebody onto a purported photograph of somebody, and magically it matches up. It doesn't matter. You could do any photo. You could have Billy the Kid's photo. And here's a photo of Kenny Maines. And all of a sudden, they start lining it up. Oh, it matches. All that does is just convolute the entire case. I would, so, great question, but my answer would be no. I don't think it would help at all. If it was this Brian Chadwell guy, I believe that you'll find the evidence of this. Um, and I don't know whether the police have ruled him out or not. He certainly, like I said in my original vid video, he looks like the sketch. Um, but that's all I know about him. So I don't know anything else. 
I do believe the police are working and people say, oh, you stick up for the police all the time. Listen, I stick up for the police when they do their job. They seem to be doing their job quite well here and I guarantee they care about these victims. If they are not doing their job, I will certainly state that as well. I have no problem of doing that and I've done it in the past. So yes, I understand the frustration. It's been four or five years. But you know, the best barometer to whether the police are doing their job or not is the victim's families. Go and talk to them. When they start getting upset, that's when I start listening. Um, if they're, they're frustrated, I understand. But as long as police are updating them and they're still working, <coughs> excuse me, feeling under the weather, and I'm still here for you guys. So as long as they continue to update the family and the family's okay with things, um, then generally I am too. So with that being said, that's it. I just wanted to go over some of these questions and comments because I can't answer them all unless you're an elite member. So um, I'm going to do that for almost all of these videos, okay? Because you guys deserve to, you know, if you have good questions, I'll give you the best response I can. And we'll go from there. Sound good? All right. Uh, again, I'll do a, this isn't really a follow-up video on this. This is just uh, answering some questions that have been bugging me and obviously have been bugging you guys. So until the next one, Mains out. Okay, so today I want to talk some more about the Delphi murders. This is going to be my second video. Maybe third because I did a question and answer session. I did the first one a, a while ago and I ran a new poll and this somehow came up on top as the next video that you guys wanted me to do. So what I want to do today is this is not going to be any special uh, let me bring this microphone up here a little bit more this isn't going to be like a any magical criminal profile or um, who done it type of thing I just want to talk through it and and have you see maybe what I see and whether it will help or not I don't know but I think today is going to obviously focus on the new information that has come out and again I don't follow this stuff re religiously um, so please bear with me if I don't pronounce something right or I don't include something uh, most of the information that I'm going to talk about today, I came about through a interview with the, one of the suspects whose name is, I believe, Keegan Klein. It was a long interview, long transcript, but I read it all, wrote down some things that we'll talk about, and try to compare what I said during the first video and see if it still holds water. Steve it still has merit to what we know now. Um, I'm not going to rehash the, everything, the timelines and the all that. We we know that. If you don't know, go back and watch the first video. February 13th, Valentine's Day, 2017. Uh, Liberty German and Abby Williams, age 13 and 14, respectively were killed they went missing for a, a time period and um, they were subsequently found the next day um, in Delphi Indiana from what a half a mile from where this bridge is they actually recorded parts of well, at least they police and investigators have released snippets of what Liberty had recorded and I guess he's known as the bridge guy. And it's just amazing, man. There are some people that are really into this. And they just, it's like they get consumed with it. And I guess I understand um, to each their own. You know, who am I to judge anybody for what they do? But I would just caution, watch the rabbit holes when you get that invested 
into a case. Now, Liberty's grandmother came out um, and said that the police have DNA. That's the first area that I want to talk about. Just because a law enforcement entity, investigators have DNA, that is not an end-all, be-all, case closed. That's a very broad statement, right? That's like saying, I have a sports car. Okay, well, think of how many sports cars there are. Is it a Lamborghini? Is it a Camaro? Is it a Ferrari? You know, is it a Mustang? Is it a Corvette? Porsche? It goes on and on. Just because you have DNA, it doesn't mean you're going to solve a case. It helps, but it also could be a detriment. Now, what do I mean by detriment to a case? DNA is becoming so um, touchy. Yeah, that's a good word, too, because let's talk about touch DNA. You are pulling up... Let's say, let's say this phone, this is my phone. Let's say this is at a crime scene and you find it, don't know whose it is, whatever it is, you swab it. And by swab it, I mean you take a Q-tip, you take distilled water and you swab the item for DNA. That, it is so sophisticated now, our technology, that it's not just going to find my DNA. It might find other DNA. Especially if you take the case off and you know mess with the SIM card. You might find somebody's from the manufacturer of the phone. You're going to have... It's very rare, especially for touch DNA, that you just find one profile. And, that, and that's it. It's usually a mixture. Now... Companies that I have used, such as uh, Cybergenetics, will interpret and break apart that convoluted DNA. So let's say you have a mixture of two individuals. Okay, well, this is belongs to this, and this belongs to that. Now, let's say, more than likely, you're not going to get a full profile. So what does that mean? That means you have two... DNAs, they're combined on this phone, and one is maybe a full profile, or maybe it's only three or four alleles, or whatever it is. It's not a complete DNA profile. So now, if you don't have a full profile, my understanding at the time that I retired, now you can't enter that into CODIS. Now, what's CODIS? CODIS is the combined uh, offender data index. Well, I don't remember what it stands for, but I know that most felons, after a certain time period, have had their DNA uploaded to this system. Therefore, when you have an unsolved crime, you can compare the DNA from the profile, from the crime scene, to the offender in CODIS. Well, what happens if it's not a full profile? You can't do it. So then, you have to match your limited profile that you have. Let's say it's six um, alleles to your suspects. And let's say they match at those six alleles. That doesn't mean it's a positive match then. See where the problem comes in with DNA? There's a lot that goes into it that people do not know. So we go back to Libby's grandmother saying they have DNA. We don't know what type of DNA. You don't know if this was a sexually motivated crime and there's semen there because A, they were sexually assaulted or B, the offender masturbated at the scene or if it's touch DNA, which you would expect from a physical confrontation if they are not killed with a gun. And again, hey, I don't know how they were killed. I can listen to a hundred different people tell you a hundred different things to say, well, a leaked text said this, they were stabbed, they were beheaded. Listen, until I see it 
on a transcript or from an investigator's mouth, I'm not going to believe it. So I don't know how they were murdered. Therefore, it is very hard to assess. I will say that I'm going to guess, and I hate to do this, but I'm going to, that they were not shot. I think that that would have been leaked because people would have heard it unless there was a silencer and then that gets into a whole bunch of different areas where rabbit holes are and I don't want to go down them. So now with a, let's get back to the DNA. Let's say, let's just say, and I, I don't know whether this is the case or not, but let's just say they have a full DNA profile of the suspect or offender. Now what do you do? Well, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to run that through CODIS. Let's say there's no hits. Well, that just means that he was either never, never arrested or his DNA was never taken and uploaded into CODIS. So there's strike one. Second thing you're going to do then is, hey, I have suspects A, B, C, D, and E. I'm going to compare that full profile to theirs. Now, how do you do that? You get a search warrant. You ask for consent. Consent is the first thing you're going to do. I've taken hundreds, if not thousands, DNA swabs uh, in the past 20 years. Simple. Hey, I'm investigating this case. You probably have nothing to do with it. I don't know, but I do want to take your DNA to eliminate you. Would you be okay with that? Nine times out of ten, they say yes, no problem. Then you'll have somebody that's not even involved, but they're very paranoid, they don't trust the police, and they're going to say no. So then, you better hope that you have probable cause to obtain a search warrant to get their DNA. If they're a suspect already, that is not going to be hard to do. Then... If that doesn't work, then you follow them around and you wait till they throw down their cigarette butt, you wait till they drink at a restaurant and you take their fork, those things. You do a trash pull. A little bit more trickier. What's a trash pull? So a trash pull is whatever they have in the garbage, they set it out on the curb, you're allowed to take it because it's discarded. You don't know unless they live by themselves that it actually came from them. So it's a little bit trickier. But it works not the same because if it comes back a match, okay, maybe now you can say, well, we're not just going to say we're use that, but we're going to incorporate that in our probable cause affidavit to get a warrant to get a DNA cheek swab. See how that works? Okay. So what happens if it comes back and you can't do any of that? You're following them around. Well, one last thing that you can do is genealogy. But genealogy will work, I believe, with a, a full profile. And I'm not sure if it will work as well as with a partial. Um, I'm unclear on that. I would think that it would not work as well. But that's the tool that we're using now, right? But that's not foolproof, right? Because if somebody from that family's... Uh, Tree has not uploaded anything to one of these sites, you're not going to get a hit. But more than likely, somebody along that way has. So that's what they will do. Now, I want to talk about this individual named Keegan Klein. I, I mentioned him briefly a year ago when I did a video on this because um, I think he may have been his name was brought up or something but he's been in jail arrested on child pornography charges he failed a polygraph in regards to this case but again that means nothing to me I've seen people fail polygraphs that had nothing to do with it. So, again, I've said it a hundred times. It's a pre-test, post-test interview in the polygraph. That's what it's all about. 
he comes off to me as somebody who thinks that he is smarter than everybody else. Now, it's confirmed that he has been using a fake uh, account of somebody named Anthony Schatz and using a picture of somebody who is an actual police officer in Alaska is what I read from a news site. So, you know how the news is. I don't trust it 100%. But regardless, it was not him. Because if you look at a picture of him, listen... Again, I'm not the best looking cat in the world, and I get that. But I think I have more of a chance of meeting somebody online than this guy. No wonder he's using a fake picture and profile. He's not going to be getting uh, too many responses if he throws up a picture of himself. Now, Anthony Shots. Fake profile fake picture, and why do you do that? You don't necessarily do that to meet people, right? Because you can't transform yourself into something else and go there unless you're Gene Leroy Hart. You are going to show up. So you go from being this good-looking model to what you actually look like. And when you do that, the other people are more than likely going to run. So what you do instead is you use that to get video, get pictures, get explicit text messages. And I, what this comes back to, it's all a fantasy. And that's very important to remember. In the criminal's mind, it's a fantasy that is lit. Now, in their mind, that fantasy could get so in-depth that they think, hey, I am. Anthony shots and it will get to the point where maybe I will actually take this fantasy step further and go and meet this person. I don't know whether he was there yet. I just know that it was confirmed from what I read in this interview that Anthony shots was Keegan Klein. Now, did I gain anything from that interview other than him thinking he's pretty smart? Um, he minimized a lot. So what's minimizing? Minimizing in interviews with offenders is like, yes, I was there, but I did not kill them. Yes, um, I got the photographs, but... Um, they weren't for sexual purposes. It was because I wanted to compare them to other photographs of people of the same age. Whatever it is. It's minimizing what they're doing. He did that a lot. What was very clear in this interview to me. No, let me back up though and say there's good reason why police are interviewing this Keegan Klein. He talked to Liberty that day. He also had stated not to Liberty but somebody else and this is all in okay so when Cell phones really, I mean, they, they were definitely there when I was on a job, but they've gotten a lot more sophisticated now. And when I was with the FBI working, uh, we had our own tech person to handle all that stuff. But you get a phone, you, you dump all the information. And then it's not just from the physical phone itself. It's from the company, the Verizon, the AT&T, Sprint, whatever it is. And sometimes to get a... A search warrant or a subpoena for these records is very difficult, okay, as it should be. At the time, I did not like it because here I'm trying to solve a case, whether it's a counterfeit uh, case, whether it's a drug case, or whether it's a homicide. I want the information. I want it now. Give it to me. But hey, we got this little thing in the Constitution, so I understand it more now. But in that, you're going to get a lot of information when all that comes back. And believe me, it's like Christmas. When you're 
working a case and all of a sudden you see an email come in from Verizon and they're like click here type in this security code blah 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 you have your information and then you start going through the texts and you start going through the search histories and all that and it's a treasure trove of information and believe me it will up your spirit when you get it now your spirit might be up here for a minute and then you read it and realize there's nothing relevant in it and then your heart sinks again but hey that's investigations but he had spoken to a friend and said that he was supposed to meet liberty but she never showed that day that's a big and powerful statement right now he denies saying this in the interview over and over and over again but you know you show them the transcripts it's right there but what is intriguing is it also shows that two different cell phone devices whether it's two cell phones or it's a cell phone and an iPad or a computer had opened up this Anthony Schatz's profile and whether it was on snapchat Instagram I'm not sure to me it doesn't matter a social media app period had it opened at the same time It is very clear to me reading that interview that those investigators believe that Klein's dad is involved. 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, I'm not here to say he is involved because I don't know. I'm not investigating the case. But I can tell by reading that there's no doubt. And for good reason, it appears. Um, but Keegan just did not seem to want to go there. I and mean, he just kept denying it. And I'm not sure what to believe out of that. Um, one of the things that Keegan did is... and There's only two reasons for this. Okay, he goes, police had this information pretty quick, okay, because within 12 days, and I didn't realize this, I thought this guy came on years later as a suspect, 12 days after the murders, he is, they, they serve search warrants on his property, or his house, his apartment, whatever it is, that's, that's fairly quick. So they knew something right then. Whether it was this Anthony Schatz profile, and I'm assuming because what I didn't understand was they're talking all about the information that they found on Keegan's phones and his iPad and all that. They're, I mean, they're going through it. They, they're reading it. You know, the stuff that he looked up was sickening. Not about murder. Child pornography stuff. But there was no mention at all about the information obtained from Liberty's phone. I found that odd. Not odd that they didn't do it, I guess. Maybe they did not, and, and, and more than likely, they did not want to give out that information. They didn't. They were holding that back. But a lot of the stuff that they found on Keegan's phone, in regards to Anthony Shots, this fake profile that he has, contacting Liberty and Liberty's friends. They're trying to get him to admit to this. He doesn't have to admit to it because it's fact. Okay? That's something you can take to court. Now, of course, the defense attorney is going to say, well, you can't prove that my client was the one that actually typed this, could you? Because he's admitted he's given his password to so-and-so. So they want him to admit that. But can't they... Just match up what Anthony Schatz had sent to Liberty with 
her phone records and her chat history and match it together and they didn't do that and it, I wonder why and it, it has to be they didn't want anybody to know what they found off of Liberty's phone I think the more that I looked into this case that you know they people like to criticize the police and sometimes it's warranted it is but let me tell you something in this case right here I'm telling you beyond a shadow of a doubt they know a lot more than people know and they are playing it from what I see and when I'm reading these transcripts reading what they let out and what they don't and I might take heat for this but I'm telling you I believe that they are doing a very cagey sophisticated and smart game and the reason is because they do not want to lose this when it goes to trial. I think they know who's responsible. I think they're just trying to, again, I, I've said this a million times. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. History has proven that time and time again. If you go back and look at other trials, when they rushed into trial, and it all depends, not on the investigators, and it depends on the prosecution. An individual prosecutor could look at the same evidence, one is a little bit more daring and he'll take it to trial, or he's a little bit more overconfident, he'll take it to trial. Where the other one is more reserved, wants more, Let's wait. What's the rush? That's what we got here, folks. I have no doubt they know more than that's let out. And I'm okay with it. Okay? I'm okay with it. Sometimes you have to be on the other side to understand. Again, it's apparent to me that Keegan Klein's dad is a suspect and they believe that he is the one who committed this. I won't say that. I will say, right here I wrote down that Klein said and they knew it was my dad. They know, they knew it was my dad. Now, is he talking directly about the murders or is he talking about... Or what? I don't know. I'm going to assume that that's what he's talking about. So, I don't know enough about the father. You know, I didn't dig into his background or anything. I did run his name quick and I saw that possibly his father had recently died. Um, I was kind of odd to see, but first I thought it was this guy and I got real concerned but when I read the obituary I think it was the Keegan's grandfather's what it looked like to me if we go back to the crime scene and if I remember correctly I brought up a big stink about the the creek creek and I remember that being a big contentious thing people were criticizing the way I said crick or creek or murder. whatever I don't give a shit right creek crick you know what I'm talking about because they were found on the other side of that compared to where they were last seen on the bridge I still contend to me this was an abduction and I still contend that the girls or girl ran and made it to the other side of the creek where they were 
killed. And I believe that's why parts of their sh her shoe was found or whatever it was. If Liberty was smart enough to record the offender who said down the hill, she knew that this was not going good. By that, I mean something bad is happening. Hence, you run. Hence, you record them. But you got to remember and try to think, how do you gain control of two suspects? It's very easy. I've covered it numerous times. A gun is the most probable way, but it doesn't have to be. If you have a knife to, let's say, your mom, your friend, your brother, sister, girlfriend, and have her, hey, you make one peep, and I'm shoving this knife into their throat. And then you're next. What are you going to do? You're going to comply. That's all it takes. I still think that this was an abduction. Because I don't see an offender going to the area on a warm day. And this is a quote by... Liberty's sister. I know I wrote it down here. Hold on. Kelsey, she dropped her off. They were listening to 21 pilots. The windows were open and it was just so warm. Then you go back to this bridge guy and the way he's dressed. And I had said that I thought that he was trolling. Remember that? He was looking for a victim. I said that's a, certainly a possibility. And he had been there for a while. I'm still not convinced of that. But when she says something like, it was just so warm. And then that guy's dressed like that. Yes. To be concealing something? Sure. Rope? Weapons? Sure. But I don't see... An offender going to a place like that that's going to be populated, school's out that day, to kill somebody or two people right there in that, in that area where their screams can be heard. It doesn't make sense. Now, an abduction makes sense, doesn't it? Now, why? Yes, you're still going to have witnesses there. But how else is a possible abductor going to obtain his prey? Especially if they were there for a specific pur purpose, and that is meeting Anthony shots. Let's say, for instance, Anthony shots, aka Keegan Klein, his specific intent is to get videos, to elicit sexual videos from these people he's catfishing. Now, everybody, the younger people, you know, you know what catfishing is. Most of my audience is that's 40 and over probably doesn't. That means just pretending that you're somebody else uh, to get something else in return. So he's doing that to obtain nudie pictures, videos. To me, it doesn't appear that he is going to be meeting anybody. Now, his father... On the other hand, that to me could be a different story.
If his father also had access to this account, it is very possible that he went there but again the more I think about it it doesn't have to be an abduction right it doesn't have to be this is the beauty about sitting here and talking this out what if the father went there and said, you know what, after all this chats, this things, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll meet with me. Or, no, I don't like that. The better scenario is if the father went there and said, hey, look, I'm Anthony's dad. Look back in the chats. In these chats, and I'm not, I don't know if they were with Liberty. I don't believe they were. But in other chats, he talked continuously, Keegan, about, if it was Keegan, it could have been the dad, but the dad's name was continually brought up in sexual context. Hey, my dad wants to know if you do this. My dad wants to see this. Would you go out with an older guy? My dad's 43. Stuff like that. So it's about dad, dad, dad. That could have been dad pretending to be somebody, or it was Keegan bringing up dad. I could envision a scenario where dad went there and said, hey, I'm Anthony's dad. Um, he wants you to come with. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna go meet him at the house or whatever. And the girls say, no. And at that point in time, they know that they're in trouble. So it is an abduction. If the girls don't comply, I'm going to abduct them and take them back. But they run. And they run across the creek. He catches them. How's he, how's he catch two people, right? He doesn't have to. He only has to catch one. Put the knife to her throat. And again, hey. You say anything, now get over here or I'm going to kill her. Once she gets it over there, now he can control both of them. He can kill, kill them. Well, let's talk about the so-called signatures. They said there was a signatures to this crime. The former prosecutor said this. He said like three different signatures. Some have speculated that means three different killers. Uh, no. Possibly two. I mean, I, I could buy into that, but I'd have to look at what evidence is there. But three different signatures, to me, I think relays more to staging than anything else. So let's get into staging. What is that? Well, what's a signature? Let's go back to that. A signature is something extra, it's an extra step that it, it isn't needed to commit the crime. Okay, say it's posing the body like this. Let's say it's wrapping a ribbon around their forehead after they're done. Something that doesn't need to be done for the crime to, it's already been committed. That's a signature. Now staging. Why stage? The reason you stage a crime scene is to make it look like something that it's not. More than likely, you see those staging in domestic type of situations or when an obvious suspect is there or they know the person. Like a, a husband killing his wife, drowning her in the bathtub, um, and then making it look like she slipped and fell. She, he's staging it to make it fit, like a suicide. Um, or whatever it is. That's staging. Without seeing the crime scene, I guess I, I don't want to speculate. But I will say that it could be staging, but it could also be simply 
could be a signature. You know, I sit here and think about it, it certainly could be. So, let me ponder on that a minute. It would be very odd to me to have three different signatures at one crime scene. That's why I just go back to staging. And if it's staging, again, remember, we're deducing possibilities to probabilities. So, why stage it then? Why stage it? Unless it's somebody they know. And to make it look like something that it isn't. But what would that be? That's the problem. Such a crazy case. Such a crazy case. I mean, if you're staging it to not look like an attempted abduction, I guess that could make sense. It's possible, but I don't think that's probable. But you just, you're not going to go there with the specific intent to kill somebody in a somewhat populated area on a warm day. I just, I, I don't believe that. And I think still it's a, it's an abduction gone wrong. You know, you, you have drug deals that go wrong. You have abductions that go wrong. Ted Bundy had an abduction go wrong. Carol, Carol Durant, right? She survived, but it went wrong. All right. Let me go over my notes. See if there's anything that I missed. Keegan Klein, jail, child porn charges. There was a ton of them. He looked up some nasty stuff. He failed the polygraph. I don't put any stock into that. The least leaked police document. Um, he used social media to contact Libby the day she died. He searched for how long DNA lasts. That's, that's a problem. Right? That's a problem. And when he did those searches, after he took the polygraph, and he went back and deleted his history on his phone between February 10th and February 15th. Now why would he do that? If he was worried about child pornography, which I think that that's what he claims, why wouldn't he delete everything? Why narrow that to the dates just before these murders and after the murders? He deleted everything. Deleted the Snapchat account, all those things. And deleting and looking up how long DNA lasts. That's a problem for him. Okay? He also looked up John Benet Ramsey, O.J. Simpson. Why? Again, it's the totality of everything, not one specific thing. There was an incident. And if you look at the timeline here, what, just after the murders, that somebody from the Anthony Schatz account was going to hook up with him and he had sent, she had sent him an address. When she gets off the school bus, she sees a guy with a mask peeking into her bedroom. I have a problem with this. And I'm not sure where my problem lies yet. But you know when you get that feeling in your stomach that there's a, there's a problem. The problem is, if Keegan Klein or his father murdered Abby and Libby just days previous, are they going to be ballsy enough, one or e either of them, to go put on a ski mask and stare into another girl's 
bedroom. A, you either have a serial offender who is not concerned at all, or B, one is unrelated to the other. That's the only thing that it can be. And by that, what do I mean? If you look at the bridge guy, who by all accounts is involved in this homicide, he's not wearing a mask. Granted, it would be kind of weird to be wearing a mask on a warm day out, right? But two days later, you have somebody that's directly involved with Anthony's shots. This fake persona that Keegan has made up and possibly his dad uses. Sending an address to a girl about hooking up at her house. He also looks up the family's information on Facebook. And then somebody the next day is wearing a mask looking into the girl's bedroom. Why? You would think that if they committed these murders, the father-son duo would be so scared out of their minds of getting caught... They're not going to do any criminal activity for a week, two weeks, months. But within days, you're back at it? That doesn't make sense to me. Something doesn't sit right. Now, it's possible, I think. Again, see, it starts getting convoluted. And I don't like that. But is it possible that dad did whatever he did by going with Liberty and Abby and whatever that mess is over here? And Keegan is the one with a mask going and peeping Tom over here? That's a possibility. Why? Well, because... Over here, the bridge guy isn't wearing a mask. He's not concealing his identity, but this guy is. That could be because it's two different people or could be the same person and he doesn't want to be identified again because he was just identified as the bridge guy. But that's a big risk. That's a big risk somebody's taken. And again, that goes back to him either being a serial offender, he's done it before, where he's not concerned, or it's not related. I don't know which. So, I'm not here to say whether Keegan Klein is guilty or not guilty, or his father. Um, I'm, it's not my case, so I'm not going to make that assertion. I still go back to saying that the girls ran and it was an abduction. That's, that's just what that part of the crime scene tells me. Now that could change. You know, if I saw the actual crime scene photos and looked at those three signatures, whether it's staging or not, that, that could all change. So, but things don't look good I'm gonna tell you right now for this Klein fella being the last person to talk to her saying that he was supposed to meet her that day and she didn't show um, that that no granted he seems to be a obviously a liar so he could be lying about that as well but when phone records start putting things into place uh, you can deny all you want facts are facts so with that said I think I'm almost done here I have down here he's a liar he's minimizing deleting his accounts after the polygraph um, I have there the interview with Keegan is not about the murders explain 
Okay, what I want to talk to you about that is they bring him under arrest for the charges of the child pornography. As an investigator, that's what you want to talk to him about up front. Back here, you know every question that you're going to ask is leading you to the truth about the murders. That is the whole gist of interviewing and interrogation. Get him comfortable as much as he you can be talking about the charges that he's in there for. Have him answer questions that you already know the answers to that help you establish a confession for murder over here. Now, sometimes you'll have a defendant who is above average intelligence and he knows see when they go in there he knows okay I have these child pornography but if he did it if he's guilty of this murder in his mind that is what he is thinking about the whole time this stuff over here yeah it's gross and it's this and that but I don't care it's this it's these murders so he's going to be very careful to the answers that he provides that doesn't link him over here. He doesn't really care that it may link him to a lesser charge of child pornography. Sure, those charges are more embarrassing than homicide, if you believe that or not. That's the truth. That's what convicts will tell you. You do not want to go to jail to be known as a child predator now regardless now I don't know whether over here they're sexually assaulted or not I don't know that yet but I know over here he has child pornography charges and that's gonna get him jammed up when he's in jail so as an investigator you're in there asking him about this stuff over here child pornography did you do this did you do now you want to get him to confess to these things even though he doesn't have to you have the evidence you have it it's on his phone it's in his transcripts it's in his history it's in his search logs it's in his Dropbox so you don't need him to confess but what you're trying to do is learn more about this this is what's important because you don't know. That's the unknown. This is known. Child pornography. Murder unknown. So you want to get him to that. You want to connect that. Now how do you do that? It's a series of questions. If I was the investigator, I'd have been up all night. Uh, I'd been for a week writing down. 100 questions, what I'm going to ask, and his response. Because I'm going to know how he's going to respond to most until you get down to about question 2025 and you start tripping him up. Um, you know what he's going to say. So when he responds with this answer that you know that he's going to give, you can hit him with this. Attorneys know this. This is what they do. You think when an attorney gets you on the stand and asks you a question that he doesn't know the answer that you're going to give? Yes, they do. And they're ready for that. It's, it is chess. It is not checkers. So I want him to talk about this murder. He may never get there. He may be smart enough to know, hey, they're trying, whether it's going here, 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 trying to get me to there and I'm not going there. That's what it looked like to me in reading that. So investigators, although they did a good job with the interview um, and they got some things, they never got to where they wanted to go. Another comment that he made during the polygraph that doesn't look good for him and is minimizing is when he said Liberty what's her name now this is after the murders after he's searched about the murders after he's chatted with Liberty he knows her last name but he's not saying it okay there's two reasons for this one 
He's trying to disassociate himself from what he or somebody he knows did. Or two, he's minimizing. He's playing it off like, I don't even know this person. But you only do that if there's a connection. If there's not, there's no reason to do it. That's what I see, folks. I have written down here that the two different devices that had the account of Anthony Schatz open at the same time, the investigators believe are two different people responding or sending messages to these Liberty being one and other girls. And the reason they believe that is because in quotations I have they're in different languages. Now I'm in different languages I don't mean Swahili or Russian or German Spanish no different language meaning phrasing okay the way somebody types the way somebody uses grammar is different in one of the responses compared to a different one I didn't see it, so I can't come to that conclusion. A good example of that is John Benet Ramsey case and the similarities that I see in Patsy Ramsey's uh, style of writing to the ransom note. That's what they're talking about here. That is why I believe, and again, I'm an outsider looking in, so I don't know. But from what I see, that's why I think they're focusing in on dad, one of the reasons. There appears to be a lot of other reasons, possibly, possibly his previous criminal history. And again, police know a lot more than they're letting on. Thousand percent. I have big exclamation mark and star next to it is clear they suspect his dad quotations I was supposed to meet her she never showed up that was from Anthony shots to um, another girl and I'm not sure if that girl was friends with Liberty or not what a sad sad case I still think it's an abduction and the girls made a run for it and they got across that crick. Again, he's not leading them across that crick. I don't believe that. It's a barrier. It's an obstacle that you don't have to navigate. I used to trap a lot and you would funnel the coyote, fox, whatever it is into your trap because they will take the path of least resistance it's no different in a human being if you're walking in a woods and hunters you guys know this when you hunt when you're walking in the woods and you have a trail there or you have woods what are you going to walk on you're going to take the trail it's the easiest path of least resistance a creek is a barrier it is an obstacle now you have to navigate that obstacle not only let's say if he parked on the other side of that at this cemetery or whatever it is once and get wet coming in and go back out that that doesn't make sense to me then you have to navigate back over that creek with two victims that you're attempting to abduct. It makes it even harder. Is it, is it possible? Yes. Yes, it is. But if he was abducting them, he had to have parked somewhere all alone. You can't risk parking in a parking lot and abducting two girls who could possibly run or scream. That doesn't make sense. 
Now the cemetery or the other stuff, it does make sense for an abduction. But there's got to be either a place in that creek that was dry and you, or there was something across the creek that you could walk. Because I don't see the offender getting wet. And I don't see the offender trying to cross a creek with two victims unless there is a support system there. Unless there is a dry creek bed. Unless there is rocks or logs across or something like that. I, uh, that's how I see it. I, it's a, it's an abduction gone wrong. And those girls ran, and tried to cross the creek, and then he crossed the creek probably and killed them there. I don't believe that they were taken from the scene and brought back. I don't believe that at all. I see no evidence of it. Um, I see this I see the search time and why I'm looking at the search time it seems like they should have been found earlier than what they were but I've seen that a lot of times where people just miss they just miss them Alonzo Brooks I think of that case there's other cases that I, I can but I can't think of the top of my head um, it would make no sense at all to kill the victims and then bring them back. That defies logic. I don't believe that. But then again, I don't see the crime scene. So I'm basically going off training and experience and um, possibilities and probabilities. That's all. And that's all you can in this case. I understand there's so many people that want answers and nobody wants answers more than the family and the police officials that are working but I promise you they know they probably know who did this okay they're just trying to get everything lined up in order to have a successful prosecution because remember look at Jean Lee Roy Hart the Girl Scout murders okay Took him to trial, maybe wasn't quite ready for that, and he was acquitted. Now, a lot of that had to do with, you know, other things, just like OJ. There's a lot of uh, bias and, uh, you know, probable race relations in both of those Native Americans and African American history that led to their acquittals, and both are guilty. One, the Gene Lee Roy Hart was just confirmed with DNA. So, I mean, they know. It's just, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And it seems like they're just trying to gather more evidence. That's what it seems to me. I can't wait for it to be solved one day completely, going to trial, and all the evidence comes out to see if, especially whether the abduction theory which is all it is that I am putting forth that I believe because an offender is not just going to come there on that day in the middle of the day to kill somebody in those woods unless there's a reason for it now, I'm not talking a sexual motivation I'm talking revenge jealousy uh, business a hit that's not what this was okay that's not what this was it's either for sure sexually motivated or wrong place wrong time that's the only two things that it can be so until you figure that out which I'm sure the investigators know which one that is you can tell that obviously from the crime scene and the autopsy and how they were killed Now, if it is wrong place, wrong time, yes, I would go by the theory that they would be killed there in the woods in the middle of the day. Okay. If it's a sexually motivated crime, no, they're not going to be killed right there in the woods. 
I still stick to the theory and my belief that they were going to be abducted and killed elsewhere. But something happened that they were killed right there. And to me, it could very well be that they broke free. One of them broke free, ran, whatever it was. Boy, the more I think about this, I just don't know. There's just too many unknowns. Too many unknowns. I shouldn't even done a video on these because it, there's just so much that's being held back that all you do is you're speculating, but people want to know what you think. And that's the reason I do these two videos is because I've been asked, what do you think? Well, this is what I think based off of this information, the limited information that I see. One, the police interview of Keegan Klein. Okay, I see that so I can tell you what I think about it, which I did. Bridge guy, the way he was dressed. I seen that him saying guys down the hill I heard that this is what I think about that the crime scene area with the crick there and the bridge I can talk about that because I see it but that's it I can't talk about motives for sure I don't have the crime scene I can't talk about signatures I don't have the autopsy results so you know I'm hesitant to talk about those things when I don't know for sure. I'm going to let police do their job. I am not going to criticize them. Now, if they deserved it, I would. You've seen me do that before. Alonzo Brooks case, absolutely horrible, shoddy, from the medical investigator to the investigators themselves. So, I have no problem calling people out. But on this, I don't think there's a reason to. And I'm not going to. I'm going to watch it play out. I'm still going to hold it a little bit, I think, to that abductor theory. I think that was the motivation. I don't know whether it's Keegan Klein guy. Uh, and I don't know whether it's his dad. But it sure looks like that's where everything's pointing. And, you know, we'll go from there, right? Sad case. Sad case. I wish I could uh, know more. Wish I could look at the autopsy. Crime scene photos. You can do a lot more and a better assessment when you have those things. But I'm just giving my opinions off of what I see. And that's it. So, Delphi, video number two. Hey, Maine's out. Okay. Good morning, first and foremost. So I released this Delphi video about uh, Keegan Klein, and uh, I got a lot of questions and emails about this search warrant, I guess, that was just released in regards to a property where the bodies of Abby and Libby were found. And the questions were, you know, what's up with this I told you all along that this guy did it so on and so forth so I went in and I read that search warrant the best I could and want to comment on some of the things that it'll clear up a lot of things I think for you guys again I did not want to uh, I didn't really want to do this video to be honest with you I didn't want to do the last Delphi update I just don't like spending too much time on one case when I'm not investigating it. I don't want to dedicate a whole channel and I don't want to jump on like uh, the bandwagon. I've never been like that. <laughs> yeah, I just I just ain't like that. I, I don't care what other people do. I stay in my lane. I do my own thing. But as my subscriber and membership count continue to go up and I'm... I'm aware of it, you know. I, I don't get bogged down with it. I don't I don't really care too much about it in the sense that whether I have one member or one subscriber, one member, that doesn't I don't care about that. It's just about putting out the content for people to see. But I do feel an obligation when those numbers continually go up and they expect things from you. 
and then I certainly don't want to disappoint anybody and I want to do my best to give you what you asked for. I mean, you come to this channel for a certain reason. I know it ain't my good looks. Uh, so it has to be something else and it has to be the content. So if you ask for more information on something, I'm going to give it to you. Hence, another Delphi video and this time to explain the recent search warrant that was released. So what I want to do here is go to the actual search warrant and look at the date, which is March 17th, 2017. It was little more than a month after the murders. That's important. We'll get to why. Um, I'm trying to think of the the guy's name that lives there. Logan, Ronald Logan. It was his property. So, first off, why why is there a search warrant being done on his property? Well, number one, the bodies were located there. Okay, so does that make him a suspect right off the bat? No, not not really especially since it's adjoining where they were but you don't know so as an investigator you got to cross every t and dot every i and what that means is we could get consent from this guy i bet he would give it go up to him hey this is what we found we need consent to search your property more than likely now i don't know this guy but in my training and my experience he would have said yes especially if he has nothing to do with it and I'll get into if what I believe at the end of this video but that can be challenged okay at trial and that's why I continue to say these investigators to me are doing everything the right way so now what do I mean it can be challenged well when it goes to trial, let's say it is this guy. The investigators don't know it. They're applying for a search warrant for the property. He probably gave consent. That's a guess. Um, but if you have probable cause to get a search warrant, that's foolproof. Okay? Then it can't be brought up. Well, he gave you consent. He was under duress. Now, what does that mean? Hey, they just came at me, a bunch of FBI agents, a bunch of police officers. I'm 76 years old or however old he is. I know he's older. And they said they found two dead bodies on my property. And I felt obligated that I had to say yes. I was under duress. It is possible that anything found, if anything was found, during that search warrant would be tossed by the judge. Therefore, you go the extra step to get a search warrant. Now, you have to have probable cause to get a search warrant. That's, that's what this is about. This is not him being a top-of-the-line suspect. From what I'm reading, he gave an alibi which was not true. So as an investigator, you were thinking right off the bat, He's got something to hide. Number one, okay, bodies found on his property. Number two, he lied about an, an alibi. Why would he do that if he wasn't involved in some way? Well, there's many reasons, but hey, as an investigator, we don't know. So let's build probable cause to get a search warrant. And I believe that's what happened. So, let's go into the document and read some excerpts from it. And I'm just going to go one by one and tell you what I think about it. The document was written by an FBI agent and describes what investigators found when they discovered the bodies of Abby and Libby on February 14, 2017. Quotes, A large amount of blood was lost by the victims at the crime scene, the agents write. Because of the nature of the victims' wounds, it is nearly certain the perpetrator of the crime would have gotten blood on his person slash clothing. Okay, so let's look at that. First part, a large amount of blood was lost by the victims at the crime scene. That doesn't indicate stab wounds. 
That doesn't indicate gunshot. Um, it, it doesn't end, indicate anything other than what it says. Now, you can infer that it was a stabbing, and you would probably be correct. But we don't know. A gunshot, you could lose a substantial amount of blood, right? But the second part of it, because of the nature of the victim's wounds, it's nearly certain the perpetrator of the crime would have gotten blood on his or person's or clothing. Okay, so if it's a gunshot, I wouldn't expect to see that language. I would expect, and you certainly wouldn't expect to see it if it was a strangulation. You would expect to see it if it was a stabbing. So, I think you can infer by that it was a stabbing. Um, now, you know, I hate to nitpick on anything, and I'm not nitpicking, I guess, but I'm just saying what I would have done if I wrote the search warrant where it says I would have gotten blood on his person or clothing, I would have put his slash her. Because unless you know, you're, you're taking a guess that it's a guy. More than likely, it is. But you don't know that. So that's what I would have put there. But it's okay. The document says authorities also found that two articles of clothing from one of the girls was missing from the crime scene while the rest of their clothing was recovered. Let's stop there. That tells me that there is two pieces from one girl, which to me would mean if they were taken as a trophy, as a souvenir or such, that girl was the target and the other girl was not. Now that might be that might be playing a guessing game a little bit, and I don't want to do that, but that's what that tells me. Or they just didn't recover it. Um, but I think they probably did a decent search there after they found the bodies to look for evidence. So pieces of clothing, gone. Um, I'd be curious to know what those two articles of clothing are. You know, my first guess is bra and underwear, but maybe not. Now, the second part of that quote is where things get interesting. It says, It has also appeared the girl's bodies were moved and staged. So let's go back to the previous statement where they said, A large amount of blood was lost by the victims at the crime scene. Now, what does that tell you? Well, it tells you they were killed right there. Okay? Right there. That's what it means. So, go back to this statement. The girls appeared, their bodies were moved and staged. All that means, in, in the simplest terms, when you're killed and your body's laid there, however it's laid, when it's moved or staged, one, they're going to be able to tell that it was moved through the natural leaves, the dirt, the surrounding area, where the blood has pulled, okay, compared to where the bodies are, if they were drugged. That's what it means by moved. Now, staged is different, okay? Staged is a specific act. And I explained this in the last video to make it look like something that it isn't or a signature. So let's say, let's say one of the, and this is just an example. Let's say one of the bodies was moved and propped up against a tree and her hands were folded like this. Let's just say, now you know she didn't die like that. Okay. So what is she staged like that now could that be a signature sure it could be but you don't know that yet all you know is the bodies were moved and staged so that tells me the bodies whether the legs are pulled open um whether I mean there, there's just so many possibilities of what staging it is could be but the bottom line of it is it's in an unnatural 
death pose. Hence, staged. The agent also references the video on Libby's phone where the suspect says, Guys, down the hill. The FBI agent confirms the full video is 43 seconds long. Only a few seconds of that have been made public. I'm not going to get into whether I think that's okay or not. The agent also confirms the girls were followed by the suspect on the Monon High Bridge trail in Delphi and that there were no visible signs of a struggle or fight. So what does that tell me? That tells me that more than likely that rest of that 43 second video is them walking from that trail because how else would they know that? Um, there were no visible signs of a struggle or a fight. I guess of all the things in this search warrant, that's the one that I find troublesome the most. I don't understand that. I don't understand. I just don't understand how there's no visible signs of a struggle or a fight. If unless you're saying you're not including the killing as a struggle or a fight. Obviously, the ground of some sort had to have been disturbed, especially if you said the bodies were moved and staged. So, I, I'm not sure about that. That would, that would, might indicate to me that my original assessment about them breaking free and running across the creek would be not true. Because I thought they had lost a shoe or something in that attempt to get away. In my read on it. So, investigators were seeking a judge's permission to search the property of Ronald Logan, who owned the land with whom we already went through that. The agent said Logan claimed someone drove him to an aquarium store in Lafayette on the afternoon of February 13th at the time the girls disappeared. However, the agent said these statements were found to be factually false and intentionally designed to deceive law enforcement. So he lied about his alibi. We went into that. Now, could it be because he didn't have a driver's license and he didn't want to be caught? Sure. Doesn't mean he's guilty of murder. Okay? Just because you lie to the cops doesn't mean you're guilty. Remember that. However, that is good to get a search warrant for whatever you need. Not just that, but that helps. Uh... Agent said Logan contacted his cousin and asked him to tell that story before the bodies were found. So they obviously got the true information probably from the cousin when they interviewed them. Based on investigators' experience, it is reasonable to believe that the creation of an alibi prior to the discovery of a crime indicates culpability or knowledge of the crime. So now that they're saying, hey, he lied to us before we even found the bodies. That's what that tells me. Okay? That's what that statement tells me. Again, so now, this guy doesn't know that bodies are being found. He knows two missing girls, and that's it. Um, so he lies about where he was. More than likely, has nothing to do with the murders. Again. The agent goes on to say, I believe there is probable cause to believe that Ronald Logan has committed the crime of murder and evidence of that can be found on Rogan, Ronald Logan's property. Now that statement may or may not be true. However, in order to get a search warrant for that property, for the fruits of the crime, which is bloody clothes, he explained, that's what more than likely they're looking for. Um, and anything else, murder weapons, so on and so forth, souvenirs. But you have to articulate all those reasonings before you can get to, I believe there's probable cause to believe that Ronald Logan has committed the crime of murder and evidence that can be found on Rogan Logan's property. Does that mean that they believe that he's responsible? I think it, it, yeah, it's possible at that juncture, at that moment in time, 
But for a search warrant, you have to put that. I mean, you have to articulate why. Why are you going into someone's home? Ripping apart their, their clothing, their bed, whatever it is. Invading their daily routine. For what reason? Well, these are the reasons. He lied about an alibi before the crime even became murder. Um... And were, there were souvenirs missing. So therefore, they might be there. In addition, the bodies were found on his property. Those are, are all articulated reasons to get a search warrant to do what? To include him or exclude him. Okay? I've, I've written, okay, let's say 100 search warrants for, for a homicide for different suspects. And each suspect, I felt, hey, I have probable cause to believe that they committed this murder. I want to search their house, their medical records, uh, their attic, their storage shed to see if these items are there. And sometimes, I've had those search warrants come back. Judge calls me in the chamber and says, hey, it's not quite there yet. You're close, but I'm not going to sign off on it until you find something else. Uh, an example. I believe that there was a suspect who committed murder, double murder, and after reviewing the crime scene, talking to family and friends of the victims, it was averred that she had a specific uh, like painting. And that painting included my suspect and it was missing from the crime scene so he was a suspect for various other reasons but I thought that at the crime scene he took this picture of the two victims and himself to his home and this was a cold case so I'm talking this was 15 20 years later I go to get the search warrant and the judge reads it and she's agreeing with everything but she says you don't have enough and I said well why she looked up and she says just because it's missing and you give good articulated reasons as to why this gentleman might have it doesn't mean he has it that you don't have enough and then she kept reading and then she says oh this witness says she saw it in his home 10 years later. Now she like smiles and says, there you go. Now you got it. Signed off on the search warrant, went and did the search warrant, and lo and behold, of course I didn't find it. But, and now I've almost ruled him completely out as a suspect. But at the time, I had enough probable cause to get a search warrant for his house. Now, if that search warrant is leaked, everybody in the world starts thinking, he's the guy. Not necessarily. All you're doing is, you, you're going to, when you have a homicide case, especially of this magnitude, you're going to have a bunch of people. Think of cases in history. Brittany Drexel, just think of that one. And how people were accused and then found out later that it wasn't. But they all had reasons as to why they were suspects. And that gets me into my very passionate pleas about not making suspects public. It ruins their lives. I'm going to do a whole video on it. And I kind of did the Elisa Lamb thing. And that's different. When you, when you have the internet sleuths and the internet people naming suspects and ruining their lives that's one area but when you start having the fbi doing it and law enforcement officials i got a problem with that okay you don't ruin somebody's life if you don't know that they committed a crime just because it's a high profile crime and you want to get your attention and get your name out there and you start publicly saying well timothy trexel or whoever Timothy Treadwell, whatever the name of uh, Brittany Drexel, the FBI came out and said that he was a prime suspect. And I said he wasn't. If you go back and watch my video, 
I said, absolutely not. His story doesn't make sense. But they went public with that to the media. Ruined this kid's life. Because he'll always be remembered as a suspect. It doesn't matter that they arrested Moody for the case. And he confessed and he found the body and everything. There's no doubt he did it. This guy, no matter what he does, goes to get a job, they're going to say, oh, that's the guy that FBI said killed Brittany Drexel. Even though it's proven false. That guy's life is ruined. That's wrong. Sorry to go off again on that tangent. I just, it is a big pet peeve of mine. Okay. So it looks like Ronald Logan died January 24th, 2022. He was charged with a probation violation for driving with a suspended license. The FBI agent says that Logan's voice is not inconsistent with that of the person in the video. I, my voice is probably not inconsistent. Your voice is probably not inconsistent if you're a male. They just throw that statement in there in order to get more probable cause to get the warrant. Uh, so, are they wrong? Is, is this Logan, Ronald Logan, a suspect? Probably not. Okay? He's not. They had to get a search warrant for that. Okay? And they had to get probable cause to articulate it in order to get it from the judge. Textbook. Okay? Yes, what did we learn from that? Well, you learned that, you know, the bodies were probably staged. You, you could probably figure out that it was stab wounds. Um, but other than that, I don't think it's a big bombshell. Um, of course they're going to do a search warrant where the bodies were recovered from. Uh, of course you are. And again, you're not just going to get consent. Because if you, let's say they do find something there. They find Libby's shoe, her bra. Well, okay, well, I don't, they're going to bring up duress, and you could lose that. You know, they get, that could get tossed at trial. So you want to get a search warrant. That's all they did here. I've done it hundreds of times. So, I mean, not a revelation. There's nothing in here, really, that is a revelation to me about this case. And again, I'm not a fanatic about this case. Uh, I look at this case just like I do any other cases. Just like Warner Spitz told me one time uh, over some beers. I'll never forget it. One of the highlights of my career, along with like talking to Diane Lake from the Manson family and stuff, that's a pinnacle. But he told me they're all the same when they're on the table. Meaning when he does an autopsy, doesn't matter if it's the president of the United States or a janitor at a local school. That's how I feel when I look at cases. So sure, some get to me a little bit more than others, but it's just another case to me. And I look at them all the same with unbiased eyes to find out the truth. So, for all those subscribers and members and people that have seen me in the grocery store recently and came up and asked me about this case and this search warrant, this video is for you. Uh, I appreciate you so much for all the kind remarks and comments that you send me and these super thanks. I didn't even know what they were. I was starting to get them. I feel obligated and I, I, I want to. You know, it's what you want, you like it, so I give it to you. Um, I aim to please. <laughs> so, here it is. I explained it, and there's no more I can do. That's it. Search warrant. Uh, Ronald Logan's property, Delphi case. Until next time. Hey, you know what's up next, right? Main's out. So, welcome back to Unsolved No More today. This morning, we're going to talk about the recent arrest in the Delphi murder case. Normally, I would not do such a video just because really no information out there that uh, the police have released as per their past uh, uh, proclivity. Uh, 
other than a name that was booked into a jail in connection with. So, but a lot of my subscribers and fans have asked, hey, would you please do a video on this and give us your thoughts? Hence, I'm up this morning with my Pete's Coffee, who still hasn't sponsored me, by the way, and talk about Delphi. Uh, I did two little short video snippets that I, last night, I took from my Delphi videos that I did probably seven months ago, maybe six months ago, whatever it was. Well, one I did over a year ago. And just saying and emphasizing that I said that the police knew more than you do. More than I do. And they were just getting things lined up. They were doing everything correctly. Everybody was getting on the police all the time uh, because they weren't doing this, weren't doing that. And, you know, hey, if the police do wrong, I'll say that they're doing wrong. But I didn't see that here. I see they were doing everything right. And I expressed that in these videos that I did previously. So I just released those little snippets to let people know, hey, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to those things because I spent, you know, almost 20 years in law enforcement. So anyhow, regardless, I, I'm not I'm not tooting my own horn because of that. Um, there's nothing to toot. You know what I mean? It's just um, I said they were doing things right and they knew more than we knew. And that's all. Now, what I might toot my own horn about, maybe. And I haven't gone back and watched all those those two or three videos that I did on Delphi. I would ask that somebody do that for me. One of uh, you guys. And see what I got right and what I got wrong. I guess we'll know more Monday when they do a press conference. But the man they arrested was Richard Allen, who was 50 years old. Uh, he worked at a CVS, supposedly. Now listen, I don't like getting into all of this because I don't know what's fact. That's the problem with amateur detectives. As you know from my past, I like amateur detectives, some of them. But the ones I don't like are the ones who put names, put faces out there and ruin these people's life without any indication that they're even guilty because that's what their amateur opinion is. And I don't like that. All I know is that Fox News and other news sources have said that this Richard Allen was the person that was arrested. So I can report that. So <clears throat> what I know is that he lived supposedly one to three miles from the bridge <clears throat> where these girls were abducted. Now, if my memory serves me correctly, I did say that in the assessment. I knew the guy wasn't a transient, wasn't a, a tourist, as some people have claimed. Uh, but I don't know what else I got right on that, and I don't think we will know until Monday. But there are some things that I can address. One is I'm asked, how did they catch him now? Well, we won't know the answer of that until Monday. But from what I see, I see from peripherally, remember, I'm not an expert on this case. I don't claim to be. I treat it just like any other case that I do. But looking from the outside in, I do see things that seem to line up. One being this Keegan Klein character being getting ready for trial and coming up shortly. And then him being taken from uh, the jail into police custody and then a search of a river near his home then the arrest of this guy all three of those in conjunction it almost makes a complete circle now why is that well only the police know right now but what I would surmise and from my training and experience I would say this arrest has something to do with Keegan Klein. And the reason being is he was getting ready for trial. That's when most plea bargains are done. What I can envision is him coming to his lawyer, you know, knowing that, okay, we're going to wait, we're going to wait, we're going to wait and see what offer we get. We're going to wait and see what offer we can get. And then no offer comes. All right, listen, I got information on this and I will tell you this. 
That's what it seems to me happened here. I'm not saying for sure because I don't know. But from the outside looking in, that's what it seems to be. Number two is, again, living so close to the bridge. Uh, I just, that's something that, I guess just your training and experience would tell you. And that's what I thought. Um, I, I still want to know whether my theory of an attempted abduction was correct. And the the big barrier of the crick and the girls breaking free. So I'll be curious to know that. I wonder if the, the arrest is made based off of DNA. And the reason I wonder that is it just seems like it was a definitive arrest. And by that, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's an arrest to get information. Sometimes investigators will do that. I have done that. I had a murder suspect and he was on probation and he got a DUI while he was on probation. Normally, that's a slap on the wrist, but because he was my suspect in a cold case, uh, I had him put in jail. No, that's not... That's not something that's over the top. He could have been placed in jail. That was part of it. But if I had not said something, they would not have put him in jail because they don't want to overcrowd the jail. They would have put him on house arrest or whatever it was. But I made sure that he was in jail, number one, so I can monitor his phone calls. I would go to the jail, talk to him, and then step back and monitor the phone calls and see what he would talk about. Number two was to put pressure on him. Now, I don't see that here. What I see here is it seems like it's definitive. Like, he is, he is the guy. That's what it seems like to me. He's not a peripheral player. And they had to have evidence of that. And it would take more than, let's say, Keegan Klein or another outside source saying that. There had to be proof. The river search, I don't think would be proof enough. Let's say they threw the knife in the river. Let's say Keegan Klein says, hey, I know who did it. I'll tell you where the murder weapon is. It's in the river. They go to the river. Um, let's say they find it. Still don't think that's enough because that could point the finger at Keegan Klein, not somebody else. So that's why I say I think it seems to me it's more solid than that, and it might be DNA. So what I could envision is um, either genealogy playing a part in it or Klein giving him up. They getting a DNA sample, probably Sarah's typically from you know, him smoking a cigarette or whatever it is without his knowledge and it matching. Then they make the arrest. That, that's what I can envision on that guy. Um, one of the things that I guess I want to address is all the amateur detectives on this case, which, again, it doesn't bother me, but what bothers me is when they when they speak with such confidence and such arrogance, which in turn to, turns to stupidity, when they say things like, it's Keegan Klein, I know it for a fact. It is Ron Logan, or whoever the property owner was there, for a fact. I know that for a fact. And you don't. Police make an arrest and it's somebody else. Are you man enough or woman enough to say, hey, I was wrong. Or are you going to be the one who discounts the police and try to make everything still fit your cocky narrative? Or three, are you going to go back quick and delete your videos? Which one of the three are you? 
YouTube and the internet gives a platform to some people that don't deserve it. Period. And I'm going to say it. When it comes to these true crime cases, you have to make sure that you're not ruining people's lives. Because you think that you're a detective. And you're not. Now, that's not to say some people aren't helpful. Some people do it the right way. But you have that in any vocation, right? You have surgeons who care about their patients. But yet, you have some that are just there going through the motion or doing some things nefarious. So, it happens in everything. But, just as you would call out a surgeon who's not doing his job properly or hurting the name of other surgeons, I do the same thing with true crime and amateur detectives. The ones who are hurting the genre, hurting the real detectives who really do care, I'm going to call you out and say that you're a joke and you shouldn't have a platform. That is a too, true digression. So I do digress on that. I just get irritated with some people's thought process, like these conspiracy theorists. And I did that Adam Walsh video, and I had people tell me that it's not Adam Walsh that they found. And I guess this is fueled by John Walsh's daughter or something. But this one person said, well... Adam had black hair and two missing front teeth. The head had brown hair and all of its teeth or something stupid like that. And it's not Adam Walsh's decapitated head. <sighs> they misidentified him. See, that shouldn't bother me. Because I think that's coming from people that are just... Don't have more than two brain cells. Now, do you think, for a minute, the medical examiner is just going to look at a decapitated head and say, oh, it doesn't look like this picture I have of Adam Walsh, therefore, it's not him. Or, it kind of looks like him, therefore, we're going to say it's him. Come on now. Down records was used to identify that it was Adam Walsh's. So please keep your stupid uh, thought process in your cranium when it, when it comes to that level of dumbness. <sighs> Number two. Let's see. What else did I read about Delphi? Um, again, something about CVS. He was a CVS employee. I believe I did say that more than likely they knew the killer peripherally. Like, doesn't mean they know him intimately, uh, but had run across them, was an associate. I don't know if that's going to be true here or not, but it seems like it could be. Uh, him, oh, this was it. Somebody said that this guy that they arrested is innocent. Already. They're already saying that he's innocent because it doesn't look like the uh, sketch. And he was a family man and had kids. So it couldn't possibly be him. Are you kidding me? How about... Let's take a look at this book right here. BTK. Now, is he innocent? He was a family man. He was in his 50s when he was arrested. Come on. Just because somebody's a family, it's time and time again you see it. Uh, you, you can't base something off of whether they're married and they have kids or their Facebook pictures and they look happy. They couldn't be a serial killer. You got to get over that mentality. We're sure. Let's address the sketches. 
First of all, sketches are not foolproof. And I know I said that in my previous videos. You can match a sketch up to anybody. The Zodiac Killer looks like a hundred different people. The sketch of him. And it looks like two different sketches, right? The two different sketches they do look like two different people. Therefore, people are saying, well, it's Zodiac's two different people. Maybe. Possibly. It's just a sketch. Please don't put that sketch out and say, listen, this is exactly what he looks like. It's just to generate leads, to give you something to go on. It might not even be the real killer. could just be a witness, but that witness might have information. Therefore, you do the sketch and you want to talk to them. That's all it is. I am very, very, very happy if this arrest is true. And remember, the guy who ran for sheriff was going to bring me in to look at the uh, the case. If you remember that when the elections were a couple months ago, he, of course, uh, he lost. And after he lost, he reached out to me and said, hey, my intention is to bring you in on this Delphi case, which I was excited about. So that is a kind of, what is, what's the word, uh, you know, greedy on my end. I wanted this sheriff to win. I knew nothing about him. Other than he seemed pretty nice when he contacted me a couple of times. But I wanted him to win just so I could go and work on the case. But it worked out. It worked out. The Indiana State Police seemed to, again, they seemed to be doing everything right. They handled it right from the beginning. So far, that's what it seems to me. I had a lot of people saying, oh, they, they're messing it up and this and that. And it, it's not, it wasn't true so far. To me, they're doing everything right. They created that task force, which was huge. And I believe it was the task force that ended up cracking it. Think of the uh, task force that they did for Ted Bundy as well. When you get like-minded people, that's why ASOC was created. You get like-minded people together who have a passion and a little bit of talent, they'll solve cases. So kudos to the police officers in this case so far. Again, I, I can't comment too much because I don't know other than there was an arrest made. He was 50 years old, which fits my profile. Uh, lived within a couple miles from that bridge, which is what I said as well. But other than that, I, I don't know. We'll have to wait until Monday and subsequently till you learn more. Hey, folks, don't be surprised. This is my job. It's why I'm considered, I guess, one of the, the best in, you know, working cold cases. Very humble about that. I really am. And I'm proud of it, though. I'm proud that people think that of me because I've been doing it and had a passion for it my whole life. And, you know, hey, you get things sometimes wrong. There's no doubt about it. Um, but you get some things right. The Brittany Drexel one, you know, got right. Um, Girl Scout murders got right. Um, Carrie Mae Parker, you know, got right. Hopefully the yogurt shop murders will be right. But sometimes I don't, I just, you, sometimes you're wrong. I had to backtrack on the Bobby Fuller case. Not just because I was wrong, it's because I was too definitive. I said he was murdered, without a doubt. But I was going against the autopsy report. And the autopsy report said he died of uh, asphyxiation from gas fumes. And I can't say that he was murdered then. So my question is to these amateur detectives, are you going to be man enough to admit that, you're, that you were wrong when it comes out? Or are you going to spin a narrative to make it fit? And to all the subscribers and followers that these people have, you know, this is how I equate. And I was thinking this driving home last night. You know, this channel and me, I'm like a credible news source, okay? Whereas these amateurs, a couple of them who have these 
channels who spew nonsense are like the National Enquirer and the Globe. And they get all the subscribers and they get all the views because of their sensationalism. The stuff that they'll put out on their thumbnails and their things. And they get all the, all the attention. I'm over here just spewing the facts and the way things are. And doing it in a professional manner because that's who I am. Apparently that's who they are. And I want to separate myself from them. And I don't care. And I've told you this a million times. I don't care about subscribers. I never ask for likes. I never ask for subscribers. If I have something to offer and you accept that, this channel will grow. And I'll continue to do these educational. And that's what they are. They are an educational video. They are not entertainment because true crime is not entertainment. It doesn't entertain us. It fulfills our sense of mystery, the sense of the unknown, because we want to know. There's nothing scarier than the unknown. So I try to educate, bring my training and experience to these cases, and I don't overstep my boundaries. I stay in my lane and go forward. So if you want real, factual, true crime information from one of the best cool case detectives in this country, you come here. If you want sensationalism, if you want things that make you go, oh, that, that's crazy thought. You're a conspiracy theorist and you think everything is conspired by the government of the United States, go over there to the Globe, the National Enquirer. Go to those type of channels. Don't come here because I don't want you. I want professionals. I want people that want the facts, the truth. I don't want crazy people. Okay? I've seen Crazy Town. I've met the mayor of Crazy Town. I don't like it. Come here. I'm not going to ask for your subscriber, thank yous, and likes. Just not going to do that. That's not me. I do this because I want it. I love it. I enjoy it. So, again, I just digress. I go off on these tangents. Must be this Pete's coffee. That's all the information I can give you on Delphi. That's all we have. I'm not going to go rooting, trying to find things on this guy to be the first person to report on it. And to have all these people come and click and like. I don't do that. I did this video for my true fans, my members, and subscribers who asked for this. So I can only give you what I know. I will not make up things just to satisfy the masses. And I hope you would respect me for that. Thoughts and prayers, as always, to the victims' families. In addition, how about we give some thanks to the investigators in this case, who so far deserve it. I guarantee you they spent some sleepless nights working this case, following up leads, it's missed time with their family. I guarantee you they also deserve our thanks, appreciation, and a salute just like this. Thank you. Man. All right, so now I'm going to talk about this Delphi probable cause affidavit, only because you guys asked for it. Uh, normally, I'd like to stick to cold cases, as you know. But, uh, getting a lot of requests for doing current true crime things. And as my subscriber count continues to grow, I feel almost obligated to give you what you want. So, I got the affidavit right here, seven pages. I read through it, and my impressions of it are not that it's weak. There has been a lot of questions to me that have stated they feel that it's weak. Well, it, it is and it isn't. It was done on purpose. 
when you do an arrest affidavit, sometimes, and I've done uh, my fair share of affidavits, you don't want to put everything you know in there. You know why? Two reasons. One is you don't need to. You only need to establish probable cause, which means a crime was committed, in this case, a double murder, and more than likely, this guy, your suspect, Richard Allen, committed those crimes. That's it. It's just a probable cause. I guarantee you, police have more evidence than this. They are just putting in the very minimum amount that they need in order to get the arrest. You do that also because you don't, the defense gets this. So Richard Allen's attorney gets this and he immediately is hiring an investigator to go out and try to debunk, cast shadows of doubt upon the facts that are in here. So why give them all of that already to work on? There's no need to. So in this case, there's two things that I see that allowed them to get probable cause to get an arrest warrant. One was witness statements. Um, not that they specifically said Richard Allen, but one group of juveniles saw bridge guy dressed the same, getting there. Another group, I know I don't, I mistake, I don't think it's a group. One person, witness, saw the same person dressed the same way, leaving at a certain time. And then there were no other sightings of this man after that time. So you see how they deduced a time frame off of that. So witnesses corroborating each other is one established element in this probable cause affidavit. Number two, and the big one, is the unspent shell casing extraction tool mark. That was a lot, right? But now that has everybody in a panic because no one assumed that these people, these people, the victims were shot. And just because this is there doesn't mean they were shot. And more than likely, I believe they were not shot. I would be surprised if I heard it come out that the victims were shot. So what does this tell you? Well, it just tells you that he had a weapon on him and why? A lot of people get bent out of shape saying you can't control multiple victims. And I always caution them that there are many instant, instant, instances, thank you, in history, Richard Speck, Ted Bundy, um, it just goes on and on, where you can control, I don't think Ted Bundy, he didn't control multiple people. Let's just stick with Richard Speck. You can control multiple people with a weapon. BTK did that to the Otero family. So he had a weapon on him to control, to comply, to make these victims listen to him. That's what I see. Now, in my earlier videos, I said that the, the offender probably parked on the other side of that creek and he was leading these victims out for an abduction. I don't know if that's true anymore based off of this affidavit. I, th I think it, it could be because that's the way he exited. A witness saw him walking down, I want to say Route 300, going to his car. His car was parked at the old Children Protective Services building. Now, I'm not extremely familiar with the layout, but I did look at the map, and from what I can see, that's a pretty good distance of a walk. I have a hard time seeing somebody being abducted walking down that far. I would think his car would have been parked much closer. Although, his car was backed in. 
And the witnesses said that they noticed that and they thought it was odd. What does that tell you? It certainly tells you premeditation. that He was going there for nefarious reasons. I still can't believe that his intention was to rape and murder these victims there. I just, I don't, I still can't buy that. That's why I still stick to the abduction theory. Um, yet, I'm man enough to say I could be wrong because of the car being parked so far away. But I, it seems like I was correct in assuming that they, he did not want to cross that creek unless he had to that the girls made a run for it. Now, I don't know that. I, it's not in here. But there are some things that I took from that. One is the timeline. The girls videotaped him at 2.13. They got there at 1.49. So, not long after they were dropped off, they were accosted. And one of the things that they didn't release is that they said, and now it makes sense of why they didn't release that, one of the girls said gun. And then after that, he ordered them down the hill. Now, just because he had a gun, like I said, doesn't mean that he shot him. Now, let's get to the big piece of evidence in this affidavit, and that is the tool mark on the unspent casing. So, what does that mean? Now, I wish I had my Glock 40 down here to show you, but if I did that, I'd probably get banned on YouTube. I don't know. Most of you know what I'm talking about. And I, this was a Sig Sauer, I want to say, gun, but... Any, any weapon where you have to recycle, you eject, you pull the slide back. If you have a round in the chamber, it's going to eject. If you fire a shot, it automatically, unless it's a revolver, will eject. Now, this is why I don't believe, well, one, I don't believe somebody would fire a weapon there because somebody would have heard a shot, Okay. So what I feel was being done here is he's using the gun to comply. He does. He wants to make them comply, do what he says, but he doesn't want to shoot them. And at some point in time, they, they didn't comply or they questioned him. They made him angry, whatever it was, and he racked it. Probably forgetting that he already had one in the chamber. And it kicked that round out. That round now has an extraction mark on it. Now, I got to be honest and say, I am not familiar with tool mark identification for extractions. I have used it and I've seen it used on a spent round going through the rifling of the barrel can be matched up. I'm not... I've never used the extraction tool mark. I've never had a case where I had to use that. I know that it's available. I don't know much more about it other than that. Now people will say, well, why didn't he get rid of that weapon? Because during the search warrant, they found it. And that's how they matched it up. It's not luck. It's, it's great police work, okay? If I would have got on scene there and you have whatever victims they are, you're looking on the ground for things, for cigarette butts, what footprints, you see an unspent round there, you're like, hey, what's going on? These victims weren't shot. That's a piece of evidence. There's some idiots that would think, no, it's not even related. Two feet from the body. And they might not even have picked it up because more than likely they weren't shot so they think it maybe has no relevance but the police did a great job they collected it they held that back from everybody you know why because it's a good piece of evidence and whoever had that weapon might get rid of the weapon but in richard allen's mind he's like hey i didn't shoot anybody there's no way they can identify this gun he may even forgot that he racked it 
and ejected a shell. He has no reason to think, hey, I got to get rid of this thing. I got to throw this weapon into the crypt. And he takes it back home. That is why police don't release everything. I think back to Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. And they were looking for a specific set of shoes that left a print, I believe in, might not have been blood, might have been outside, but whatever, they, they got a good shoe print and they matched it to a shoe. And the mayor went out on TV and announced it. Richard Ramirez took those shoes and threw them in the river. That's why you don't release everything. Brilliant, brilliant police work to be able to keep that quiet, knowing that, hey, someday we might be able to match this extraction mark to a weapon. And they did it. Now, how did they come to that? In the affidavit, there's a statement there from Richard Allen. Now, that statement was given because he was interviewed as being on the bridge. And he stated, uh, you know, he puts himself at the bridge, number one, okay? Number two, he says where he parked, which is where witnesses saw that he parked. It says here, potential follow-up information. Who were the three girls walking in there? So he was just interviewed. This tells me, I've done this in hundreds of cases where you interview people, neighborhood canvas, and you're just... You're just interviewing people and giving short snippets of what they say. Detectives then will get that and they'll go over it and say, hey, this one needs re-interviewed or, or whatever it is. He needs followed up on. They followed back up on this, on this guy, ran a background on him, see that, you know, he has a gun. Um, they re-interviewed him, asked him some more questions, um, and they knew that... He had, how do I say this? That, that weapon, they knew that it would match his weapon. And the reason being I can tell is because they make sure when they re-interview him in 2022, I want to say, this year, when they re-interviewed him, they stated, has anybody had your weapon? Did you let anybody use it? And he said, no. In his mind, he's done nothing wrong. They can't link me to that crime scene through this weapon. Does that make sense? But police already knew that they could. And why they asked that question is because they wanted him to pretty much in, incriminate himself by saying, because what if he would have said, oh, yeah, I give that weapon away all the time? Well, now you have doubt, right? But he says, no, I've never given it away. And he places himself there during that time frame. So what the police are doing is what is perfectly done is they're deducing their suspects until they get to one now at least this one right so that's what i saw with this let me go over my notes here because i know i probably didn't cover everything for you put himself in the vehicle there during the time frame the biggest thing here that i want to talk about is this time frame of how long it took for him to kill 2.13 p.m., he says, down the hill. At 3.57, he's seen walking on that road, bloody and muddy, from probably crossing that creek to get the girls who ran, my guess. But that is almost two hours uninterrupted, the middle of the day, committing these murders. It doesn't take that long to murder, folks. Seems to me something went awry. And then there was some sort of posing. 
that was done, and I don't want to speculate, but something was done that he was there for two hours. That's a long time. That's a long time to be left alone doing what you're doing to two victims. That is the most telling thing to me out of all of this probable cause affidavit. It's two hours with those bodies. The extraction evidence, no spent casing. I could be wrong on that. They certainly could have, but I would think that if they had a spent casing, they would have linked the rifle boring of or the barrel, the gun boring, it's not a rifle, um, to the spent casing, the bullet, not the spent casing, the bullet, or a spent casing, either one. It's A bullet does not seem to be fired at this location. It's just an unspent round. This removal of bodies thing that I just thought was absolutely freaking ridiculous is people saying the bodies were moved and then they were brought back and I kept saying he, you guys are idiots you really are if that's what you believe nobody is going to murder somebody in a horrific fashion like that take the bodies out and move them back that's stupid now there are stupid criminals I get it but that would be very very stupid um they were just missed during a search. It happens all the time. Okay? The kidnapping, the attempted abduction, which is what I thought took place. I think maybe, I don't know. I, it, it'll come out later, but I might be an ass because of that. Because I assumed. Um, but I... I in my defense, I'm trying to account for why the girls are found on the other side of the creek. Yes, I think maybe they made a run for it. Um, or, but why is he leading them that way? I, I can't see him trying to sexually assault girls in the middle of the woods like that. But he certainly could have. He certainly could have. You get them deep enough in the woods there, absolutely could do that. So maybe it was an, ab an abduction gone wrong. Um, that's it. Now, I know I didn't go into specific details of every little thing in here, but I gave the gist of it. I'm not an attorney, you know what I mean? So I can't speak on the legality of this. It looks like they pieced together surveillance from areas, witness statements, leads them to an individual who was on the bridge. They just kept narrowing it down there. And who fits the description? Okay, that takes out... These 40 people, how many males were there? Okay, that takes out these 10 people. Uh, how many own weapons? Because they, you know they have an unspent casing. Uh, that eliminates these people. Okay, the car was parked this way and it matches his car. It was backed in. It seems like they narrowed it down fairly well. And I'm guessing... I don't know, but I would guess that they have more evidence than this, or they wouldn't have made the arrest. You don't just make the arrest just based off of that, I don't think. But again, that's up to the prosecutor. He looks at it and looks at the evidence. He has to approve these charges, okay? I've had cases where I've written up arrest affidavits. I've gone to the DA, and he's read it, and he's come back, and yeah, yeah. Better find some more, or I'd like this added. Yes, I could give you one, but... So it's up to the prosecution, okay? They have to get that signed off on. Um, I'm guessing they now, if they haven't before, are trying to get DNA linked to him from the scene. I'm sure that they interviewed his wife, his friends, families... So it's almost like a second part of the interview or second part of the investigation begins after the arrest or after you have a suspect, okay? The monitoring of police calls, monitoring of visits, um, everything now is focused in on trying to convict and get more evidence, if you can, against him because you don't want to lose it at trial. 
Well, you know, that's the goal. So for people to say that this is weak, the affidavit, they got more. I'm sure of it. You just had to put enough in there to get them in jail. Okay? That, that's all you need. Uh, they're not going to put every single detail in that. It'll all come out of trial. Again, I, and I might be in the minority of this, and that's okay because, you know, I, I don't mind standing alone. And I never have been. I think the Delphi police did a good job, and I know it took six years. But sometimes, you know, you don't have a, a smoking gun. It just doesn't happen like that. This ain't CSI. This isn't TV. It takes time. You know, there are a billion people in the world, and you got to start deducing from that in order to get your suspect. And it's remember, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. So, be, right now, reading that, because of this Richard Allen's mistake of trying to intimidate the victims, probably, by racking that slide and ejecting a a bullet that he had in the barrel already got him caught. So I'm glad uh, criminals are stupid sometimes. I really am because that solves a lot of cases. Sometimes it's the criminal being stupid, not so much the investigator being smart. So I'm just happy they caught him. And I, I, I look forward to seeing everything. But this affidavit was was very uh, very well written. It was proofread and probably went through about six different people making changes on it, especially the prosecutor. Nope, take that out, leave this in, change this wording, uh, put this in there. So I could tell it was very well crafted, like a good crafted beer, like a good crafted porter beer, nice and dark and range just right just amount of foam on it that's what that affidavit reminds me of. now who else can make a an analogy between a probable cause affidavit and a porter beer only here that's why you watch me hey hopefully that helps out maybe uh if this wasn't good enough you know, i can go by paragraph by paragraph and read these and we talk about each paragraph and what that means to me if you want, if you want to go in that in depth, uh, let me know, and I, I will. But hey, this is uh, this is what you get for today. Okay. Till next time, Maine's out. Good morning. Today I want to discuss a little Delphi update. I haven't kept up to date too much with Delphi after my last, uh, really my initial video about it, um, but. Today I did see something about um, the offender, Richard Allen. I believe that's his name. <laughs> Again, I haven't looked at it too much uh, because it, you look at the crime and you can tell, at least I can tell a lot of times, that not who the offender is. That's impossible. But you can tell the type of offender and whether things fit. And when he was arrested, everything kind of came together. If you go back and watch my first video about the case, you'll see a lot of what I said matched Richard Allen. So he allegedly confessed, and this was confirmed by his attorney and uh, the prosecuting attorney, from what I gathered. I saw a picture of him getting transferred from, you know, court proceedings probably, and whew, he went downhill. Jail will do that to you, you know, and the weight of what somebody did, a heinous crime like this, especially a nationally uh, known uh, case like this, it will play on you. And you could see by his pictures, he was gaunt, lost, looked like a lot of weight. He didn't look like he was all there. Um, and that, uh, maybe they more than likely have him in protection, protective custody, meaning he's not in general population and he's probably isolated. And, you know, I think of that and you think of somebody like Bill Nagara, 
you know, who I've been corresponding with from death row for years. And he was on, you know, segregation and uh, being by himself for almost 40 years on death row. So this guy has only been in prison for not even prison. I think he's in, just in jail uh, for less than a year in the mental and physical state and told that it took on him is horrendous. But the reason for the update is the confession. Delphi was the first case that I kind of looked at the other YouTube sites and creators. Um, and remember shaking my head at all the conspiracy theories and then even after the arrest how they were still right and wouldn't change their opinion and it's the guy hiding look if you look at this photograph close enough and zoom in you can see a guy hiding in the bush <laughs> and all this nonsense uh and i got an email the other day from somebody and he had said that you know he echoed my thoughts on a lot of things he's like i just can't stand how these some of these youtube creators uh the, the asinine stuff that they say and then they continue to back it up and and you know he said i'm so sick of it and hey welcome to my world okay so delphi was my introduction to that um and I got, I got a couple emails, or not emails, yeah, they were emails, I think, or comments back then from the, a channel that at the time specialized at, in the Delphi case. And when I did my Delphi video, uh, he had enough balls to comment on my stuff and tell me how wrong I was. And it turns out I was right, um, but... You know, and then I looked at his channel and I saw all these subscriber numbers for his idiotic stuff. And that guy was a complete jackass. Uh, man, you, you don't, this is, there's certain things in etiquette that you just don't do when you're a professional. Obviously, he, he's not a professional. Um, but I'm like, how does, how does somebody like him? No experience, a complete jackass, have all these subscribers, and they believe. That's the worst part. They believe what he says. And it boggled my mind. And, of course, I never responded to this idiot. In fact, I, I believe I had him blocked just because... He, he, he was such a pain in the ass. Thinking that he... I mean, the ego on this guy... For having zero experience but I digress the point is the Delphi was the first case where I, I started noticing these YouTube channels pop up and people gravitating to them even though the content was certainly wrong it might be visually appealing which this guy's site apparently was um, but his information was wrong and that's how misinformation gets spread. Now, Richard Allen confessing to these crimes, uh, whether he was alone or not, and I believe back in when I looked at it in the first couple of videos, I said that he certainly more than likely was alone. But I think the last video I did right before his arrest I know they were talking to Keegan Klein. They had pulled him out of jail. And I know from, you know, my experiences, when, when you do that, um, you're getting information. The next thing I know, the police are searching an area, in a river or something, and then they make an arrest. So to me, I quickly uh, correlated Keegan Klein's being pulled from jail to that. It may or may not have been related. It could have been completely coincidental that they then went and went and searched and then arrested him. But at the time, it certainly I felt that that had something to do with it. Um, but 
this wasn't my first introduction to conspiracy theories. I'm going to be doing a case here next week. It was my first introduction to conspiracy case, or theories and theorists. And that was the case of Jennifer Hill. A 50-year-old case that happened in 1973, but I got the case with the district attorney's office in 2013. And it took me a year to do the review. So this is going to be like a whole week's worth of one of my cases that I looked at. And it's sure to bring controversy because it always does. Every time it was in the paper or I got quoted, it was in my book, people got bent out of shape. Both sides, prosecution and defense. But I'm at the point where I don't care anymore. That you know, It's about the truth and it's about transparency. Uh, but in this case... The Delphi case, it was my first time on the internet type of YouTube, specifically, where I saw a lot of misinformation. And then it went, it went tenfold with Idaho. And, you know, I don't really, I never watch other people's true crime content. I just, I don't. But before I started my channel, and in the very infancy stages of my channel, I did look at who had channels and what what experience they brought and there was a lot of Delphi a lot of Delphi and when I looked at them and seen what they were putting out very disheartened I mean I was just like where do these people I mean everybody has an opinion you know and you're you're but there's a great quote that's on my Facebook page that I really, really believe in. And it says, and this is from, I think, Plato, you know, or maybe it's Marcus Aurelius, that the opinion of 10,000 people means nothing when those people know nothing about the subject matter. And that's exactly what I thought. You know, everybody can have an opinion on, let's say, Delphi. And when you look at the crime scene, um, I mean, yeah, it takes a little bit of figuring. You're not, you don't know right then and there. There's a lot of variables, but when it all comes together, you can figure out some things. And what these other creators were, were opining, I was like, where, 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 where do you get that from? Um, you know, I don't. I know a little bit about electricity and running electric, but when a professional electrician comes in here and does his, I don't stand there and say, no, you're wrong. It should be done this way. You know, it, and the sad part about it is the victims' families nowadays in the Internet get drug into all of this, and you just have to stay off the Internet, and that is it. I took the bold step of turning off my comments and everybody said that's a death nail you can't do that you can't do it and I was like listen number one I'm I'm doing this because I enjoy it for no other reason you know uh, it's what I do it's what I've been doing for decades there's no repercussions to me they're like you're not going to get any more subscribers or views and this has been three or four months now, and there's been no change other than my mental health status, which is a hundred times better because I don't have to read all these stupid opinions and people telling me that I'm wrong and, and the trolls and stuff. I mean, Joe Kenda had it right when he told me once when I asked him how he dealt with the Internet with his TV show, and he had two responses. Both were great. First one, he said, yeah, some guy sent me a message one time or came up to him, you know, and criticized his television show, The Homicide Hunter. And I think it might have even been like a colleague or somebody in law enforcement. And he said his response was, how's your television show doing? And I thought that was brilliant, right? And then the second one is he told me that... Uh, the internet is a sewer and swans don't go in the sewer and that hit me you know and 
I, I try to abide by that as well. And that's one of the reasons I turned off comments. Uh, you just don't have to deal with it. And I wish more creators would do that. And I think the more professional creators, like the ones with experience, will eventually start doing that. The other people that live for the drama and the conspiracies and and that's how they get their fame, they'll leave their comment section on. Uh, but I think you're going to see that trend. And I'm glad that I was able to be one of the first people to start that. I, I just don't like comments. I don't like reviews. You know, I never go buy reviews, Amazon reviews and stuff like that. I just... Whatever, it's the internet. But anyhow, boy, did I digress big time. My apologies. It's supposed to be about the confession of Richard Allen. And if it's true, uh, which I believe it is, there's no reason to, it's not. I mean, it's not just the prosecution saying it. It's the defense as well. Uh, I'd be curious to know what those confessions were. Not that he just did it. I want details. And these people that, after the arrest affidavit came out and they were blasting saying, oh, it wasn't him. You can't tell that by an ejector uh, mark on a, a live bullet. It was planted. Why would he uh, have a live bullet there, a live round? And It's exactly why I turned off comments and try to stay off of the internet. People that have no idea what they're talking about can spout off and give an opinion when it's it, they just don't know and it's no fault of their own i guess but you have to if you don't know you can't put out misinformation that's all i'm saying this guy this richard allen i whether he was alone whether you know he was part of a ring i don't believe that i really don't but uh I'm curious to know how he, whether, I think in my first videos, I said that more than likely the person was there looking, trolling for a victim. That's what I'd be curious to know. If he was there looking or if he specifically knew that those two were going to be there. That is the biggest question for me. So remember, a lot of times you can look at a crime scene. A crime scene speaks to you. It tells you certain things. It tells you whether it's domestic violence. It tells you whether it's a weapon of opportunity and there was an argument and it got heated and that's what happened. Or, you know, if a gun was used and it's more of a revenge. Remember, GSR, greed, sex, revenge. It's got to be one of those. If you use that analogy and that terminology for this case, you know, two victims. Okay. That, that tells you something. They were moved. They were placed. They were propped up or whatever it was. That tells you something about the offender. To me, it's, it's obviously either staging or it's a, it's a sexual fantasy of some sort. One or the other. But it tells you something about the offender. Okay, he's got to be this big, this size, male or female. It tells you a lot of things based on that. The weapon being used. Okay, how did he get him to comply? Could, he, could it just be a knife? Yes, it could be. But then when they come out with, okay, there was a bullet found. All right, well, it makes sense now. If you go back and look at my first video, I say he has to control them, get them going. I thought it was an abduction gone wrong. He was trying to abduct them, get, him, get them to his car. Um, and I, I don't know whether I'm right about that or not. But I do know that he backed the car in so the license plate wouldn't be seen. Uh, so he was there for nefarious reasons. It wasn't a, because of that little, that little detail, the car backed in. Uh, victim, not victim, suspectology would tell you whether he did that all the time and it was just natural for him. But if it wasn't, then you know it's not, more than likely, it's not a killing of opportunity. Meaning it wasn't, it was, it was pre-planned, premeditated. It wasn't something that was spontaneous. Just by that little act of backing the car in so the license plate isn't seen. But controlling the victim. Okay, bullet was found. Okay, well, it's pretty obvious how that happened. He more than likely racked, didn't know that he had one in the chamber, and he, or he forgot, and he racked it 
to com make them comply. They were probably like, oh, you ain't, well, I don't know whether they said that or not, but I'm, in my mind, hey, you're, you're not serious. They're not listening, whatever it is. He wants to emphasize intimidation. He racks it, puts one in the chamber. Oh, well, the other one that he had in a chamber ejects. And that leads to his downfall. One of the things. But uh, just a lot of things that you... And the way you know this stuff is through training, through experience, through passion. Okay? I've been doing this for decades. Okay? Three decades, let's say. I started researching and then implementing... And then back to researching some more. You're always researching. But when you look at enough of these scenes, it's not 100%. But a lot of times it gets pretty close. You can tell, you know. And I guess that's what separates the professionals from the amateurs. Nothing wrong with the amateurs trying to do what they love. If they love and enjoy, if that's the reason... Is because they love and enjoy true crime. There's just a specific protocol and a way to go about it. And the way is not to hurt other people. Even suspects. You think you know a suspect and all of a sudden you're, you're harassing them online. Even going to their house. And it turns out not to be them. Even if it is them. We have a system in place that deals with that. And you are not in that system. What gives you the right to do that? Okay? So you can have your theories. As crazy and asinine as they are, um, you, you have that right to say this is what I think happened. You put it out there, which is very unfortunate that that occurs, but that is today's day and age. You put it out there. Some other people, gullible, not knowing, latch onto that and say, ooh, that sounds good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with that as well. Then that gets spread. That's bad, okay? But you have the right to do that, okay? And those people have the right to believe those words. But what you don't have the right to do is to harass and put out people's names that have nothing to do with it just based off of your theory. You know, you have no evidence. It's just the theory, so that's the part that I really frown upon because it hurts the victims' families, especially these, and I'm going to say idiots because they are idiots, on the Idaho case that want to start to point the finger at the dad of one of the victims, the mom of one of the victims, and then start running with those rumors. And the reason you're doing that and you're putting that out on your YouTube channel is so you can get clicks because the more people that watch, the more money you get. And that's very unfortunate in true crime. It's very unfortunate. They've gone through enough already losing somebody. And then your dumbass has to come along and make it worse by accusing them. With no training notes. Well, one FBI, former FBI agent, I have a video about that. He did it too. And he's just as guilty and he's just as wrong as everybody else. So, never put out there that somebody's guilty, that somebody's a suspect, and somebody did it without full proof, full knowledge, and it's already been out there. You're not breaking any news, okay? You're a little YouTube channel, okay? So, that's my two cents on this. Wait for the confession. The judge says that they're going to be putting up a portal that's going to be releasing some of these documents in regards to the Delphi case. Stay tuned for that. Because what's going to happen is these idiots that said that Richard Allen is innocent and they're not going to back off of their, their theory because um, they're going to continue to get views. You know, as soon as they admit that they're wrong, half of their subscribers are probably going to leave, hopefully. Uh, now, and listen, it's okay to be wrong. It, that is okay. You know? But you got to admit it. Admit when you're wrong. You know? Um, I forget where I was going with that, but the portal, oh, all the documents will be released, and then 
they will latch on to that for their channels and um, either agree or disagree and it'll become a conspiracy theory or, or not. Uh, I, I guess what people have to do is search around, I guess, for some YouTube creators or whatnot and try to latch on to ones that just are not about drama, okay? And not about hurting other people for clicks. They're going to give you the facts. They're going to give them to you straight. Give you an opinion based off of... When you give an opinion or a theory, you have to base it off of something. You can't just throw it out there like a lot of people do. Those, those people... Nobody should watch them. Okay? But... Anyhow, I'm not going to drag this on. This is about Richard Allen's confessions. I'm curious to know, you know, not that he did it, that we know, that I know. Uh, what I want to know is confession to details, okay? Exactly what happened. That's very powerful. Do you understand that? That is the most powerful thing for an investigator, for me personally. You can get a conviction based off of DNA, Let's say you have a 12-year-old person that's murdered and it goes unsolved five years um, or whatever and then DNA finally comes along and it solves it. No doubt about it. Guy never says anything. He goes to trial, never testifies, no nothing. He's convicted. He goes to jail. That's the end of the story, right? No. See... That's what separates good investigators from somebody that's just doing their job. People that are passionate. Because now, I want to know, that's not good enough that he's just put away. Not for me. Maybe for the parents, because there's justice and stuff. But not for me. For me, I, I worked on the case for five years. I want to know, okay, how did that shoe end up there? Because it was a question during the investigation. I could not... Put my finger on it. Why, 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 why? Why was her ring removed and put on the other girl's finger? This is not Delphi. I'm just making this up. But during my investigation, I uncovered that. And I didn't put it out to the public. Okay? It, it, it drives you mad. Because you're trying to figure out why. Why? Why did he do that? And then you formulate a theory. Okay, he's trying to make her, her. There's some sort of symbolic measure from doing that. But I don't know. Well, when you have a full confession with details, years later, or whatever it is, that's why that's so powerful. Because it puts to rest those questions. Okay? I would want to generate the questions let him confess, and then hit him with these questions if he didn't address it in his confession. And then let him give it to you. That's when a case is totally at ease. When you totally can relax and be like, okay. I can take the case finally that's been sitting on my desk for years and put it in the filing cabinet. Confessions are beautiful, but it's the details of the confessions that you want. The prosecution, most, most of the time, only wants, a, yes, I did it, and a couple details so they can present it to a jury or whatever it is to solidify the case. Not a good investigator. He wants more. And then even after those questions are answered, then I want to get into the psychology of it. Why? What were you thinking the day before? Were you fantasizing about it? And then go to, what were you thinking before you put this plan into motion? Did you have a backup plan? Why did you, you know, park your car like that and walk to the scene? Why didn't you drive? After the crime, what immediately did you do? Did you have remorse? Did you have an endorphin rush? And then after you, could you sleep that night? It, yeah, I slept like a baby. That tells you things that you can use in your next case. 
you know, post-offense behavior. What triggered it? You know, or pre-offense behavior. And then post-offense, how did your behaviors change? Did you drink more? Did you do more drugs? Did you become less social? Did you hide out? All those things. That's what's important. That's the crux of an investigation. Not just that he did it and then we lock him up and, okay, let's move on to the next one. Not for me, anyhow. That's what I want to know. That's what I look forward to in these Richard Allen confessions. And I hope they address those questions. That's what I want to know. All right. That's it for this edition, this update on Delphi and my rant on true crime, how it's become downhill, in my opinion, on the Internet, my opinion. Hey, thanks for watching. Names out. Okay, welcome back to the channel. So today, uh, just briefly, because I've had a couple people text me actually um, and ask me some questions about uh, Richard Allen and his uh, alleged confession. Now, I did a video not too long ago when I that news first broke, but I guess this is kind of uh, different in a way because people uh, trying to understand how he confessed to his wife. So let me explain. I mean, I don't have any inside knowledge. I'm not there or anything, but this is how I see it played out. Uh, uh, so allegedly, from what I gathered, from what uh, friends have told me, uh, that, and I think CNN reported it, is that Richard Allen confessed to his wife over the telephone and then she hung up on him. First of all, is this newsworthy? Yeah, I mean, it's newsworthy. It's a confession. Should never been leaked. I, I don't know how that happened um, unless, you know, if he pleads guilty, uh, then it's kind of a, a moot point. But this is what happens in jail, folks. So you arrest somebody, they go to jail, uh, there are loud calls. Okay, it's how it is. It isn't uh, the one call. You get the one call, it's been my experience, usually at, when you arraign somebody. At the uh, arraignment, the judge will usually say, hey, you know, your liberty has been taken from you. Uh, it might have been at a traffic stop. So therefore, nobody knows anything and people might be worried, right? You arrest somebody, they throw him in jail. If he doesn't have any contact to his family or stuff, they're gonna be worried. So you most judges allow hey you make a call you got somebody that you can call well some people want to take advantage of that and sit there and try to talk for a half an hour or call this person call this person you know it's the way some people are you, you give them an inch they try to take a mile hey one call tell somebody where you're going to be you know the jail that's it and once you get to jail it's a county jail you know, you're not sentenced automatically to a, a state facility, a prison or a, a federal prison. It doesn't work like that. You usually just go to a county jail. Now, could be different with a high profile case such as Delphi. That I'm not sure about. But prison calls, I've listened to literally thousands upon thousands of calls in cases and it's funny is because everybody knows and that, that it's recorded and it gives you a reminder. Hey, your phone calls are subject to monitoring and recording. It tells you right on there. So both parties, the, the inmate and the person that's talking to them know. But you listen to them all the time. And it seems like in the district attorney's office, that's all I ever did. One, because they are a great source of information. I had a, a cold case where I listened to uh, thousands of hours of it. And yes, you're listening for the first confession. You want that or your clue. But I tell you what it does to you. And I didn't realize it at the time. That's been over 10 years now. But I realize it today. Is the amount of information that you get paints you a picture and it's usually a different picture of your suspect. 
Uh, I had this guy who was a suspect of murdering uh, a five-year-old and her mom. And I listened every day, hours, eight hours a day to him talk. And th that's all they have to do in prison, you know, they, they live to talk. So he was always calling, mostly his parents, but some other people, and he would have visitations too, and those are recorded. And I would just listen and listen. And it, it, it paints different pictures. I mean, he was so manipulative. So I learned that about him that I didn't know. Very bossy. Um, he portrayed himself differently than he was on the phone. And just, you can learn so much and you learn about the people that really support him, the, the fake supporters, the ones who believe that he should be in jail, the ones who believe that he shouldn't, you, all that, you learn. You learn that people get comfortable on the phone, and they know it's recorded, and normally they're not going to say, yes, I murdered them. They're cognizant enough, but sometimes they'll let things slip. Sometimes they get comfortable, and they're just talking, and they don't, they just forget that it's being monitored and they'll get on the subject. So usually I found that the, usually the first couple of days, usually like that first day that they're in there, that's when they'll talk about the case. Then everything else for the next couple of years in some cases, you never get it again. But then you listen to all that. The rest of it is politics in prison how's aunt susie doing how's the cousin doing is this how's the dog doing things like that that is not relevant but it paints you a picture so in this case with richard allen i can see by pictures he's deteriorating and i talked about this in a previous video you know the weight not waiting the weight of committing a crime like that not only, I don't think it affected him too much subconsciously because think of the years that he was free and he looked normal, right? But now that he's in prison is now when he's deteriorating. Uh, so it, I don't think it's the remorse. I don't think it, you know, some people when they murder, they do go through phys physical and psychological changes, but that's because they have a conscious and it weighs on them. They'll begin drinking more, smoking more cigarettes, whatever it is. I don't th see that with Richard Allen because he didn't exhibit that from what I saw after the murders until he was caught and then in jail. Now, why did it change in jail? Well, one, I'm pretty sure he's probably not used to the conditions of prison. Hey, listen, you know, it's no joke. Okay, number two, and I think this is the biggest one. Y you're in there for a despicable crime. A sexual assault and murder of two kids. And I, I don't know if they've come out and said that they were sexually assaulted, but make no mistake, it was, it was sexually motivated crime. They don't like you in prison. Just like they don't like you out here when you do those things. They don't like you in prison. He is getting catcalled, you know. When anybody sees him, I am sure. We're going to get you. Things like that. That will work on your psyche because you know your day's coming. Okay? Um, it's just a matter of time. So I think that has a lot to do with his physical condition. Now, listen, I know nothing about the gentleman. And I say gentleman loosely. I know nothing about him and how his mental... He, I can just go off of some, some video clips of how he was, then how some pictures looked of him previous. He doesn't look like he deteriorated until his time in prison. When I think about it, that's kind of the way it should be, right? I mean, that's, that's, I guess it depends on what you think prison's for. But he's talking to his wife and he says, I killed him. Now, I don't know if he's 
apparently he said it multiple times and she hung up the phone on him. I've also experienced that on calls when talking about the crime where in that same case, it was a different suspect. I was monitoring his calls. And he got into it saying, you know, I didn't kill them. And she said, well, I don't know where you were that night. You know, I was laying right beside you. And his voice would change and it would crack. Sometimes it would drop to a whisper. And then she would scream back and then she hung up on him. And a lot of times I read into that a little more than what I should have. Because I don't know them. I only know of what I'm hearing on the phone. I don't know him personally. You know what I mean? So it's hard to say that's normal behavior versus it's not normal behavior and there's something there. It's a very tricky uh, thing. You think you're just listening to calls, you know, but that's not how it is. You know, when I used to do wiretaps, we would do them for cases with the FBI. And it's the same thing. You, you're you listening. Okay? You're listening. You can only listen for so long. And if it's not pertinent, if it's not relating to the wiretap, the reason that you have that tap, after like 30 seconds, you, you hang up. And then after 30 seconds more, I think it might be two minutes, it, it, and then you listen again. And if they're talking about what you're have the wiretap about what a murder or drugs whatever it is well now you can listen and you can record uh, and it used to do that <laughs> seemed like a heck of a lot and you would learn so much about people um so i mean prison calls are a great way when i talked to bill nagara here who wrote that book when we were doing our weekly show and he still calls me i just talked to him today as a matter of fact because he's getting transferred to a, a different prison next week or in three days or something like that. But it tells you, hey, you got to call San Quentin Prison. It doesn't say death row, but uh, this all calls are subject to monitoring. All those calls are being recorded. Everything that I say, and I'm very aware of that, obviously, because my whole career seems like I've listened to prison calls. Uh, but I always am thinking while I'm talking, I wonder who is listening to this. Because, you know, you can't monitor ever. I don't work in a prison, so I don't know. Maybe there's somebody in there and that's their entire job is to listen to every single call. I doubt it. But maybe they have it structured and set up like that. Uh, it should be. I would be a proponent for that because you never know what pertinent information might slip by. There might be somebody that has confessed to murder that's on a hard drive. I was going to say a, a CD somewhere, maybe or DVD, but it's probably a hard drive now somewhere that no one's ever listened to. In the murder of Gail Matthews, when I first took over that cold case from, what was it, 1994, I got it in 2000, let's say, seven 2008 i don't know what it was something in that area the first thing one of the first things i did was when i went through the evidence i was like wait a second there's no prison calls here and they arrested a suspect twice that is bad police work and and why is that not done that should have been one of the first things done i went back and oh well it's on an old system I don't know if we can get it off for you. Uh, we had this problem with it. We can give you it from this date <clears throat> and this year, but anything previous to that, it's been wiped and this and that. And I was like, oh. such a lost area of opportunity because somebody was, you know, derelict in that. I mean, hey. When I took over the case, there was some stuff that I probably should have done and I didn't. So, I mean, I'm not bad-mouthing the investigators. It was just something that I certainly would have done. And I remember wondering why it wasn't done. So, anyhow, Richard Allen, prison call, confessed to his wife, big deal. 
Yeah, pretty big deal. They have a recording now. They have a confession. So I'm sure it's it's going to be used in part of a plea negotiation. Unless, yeah. I guess he could say, hey, let's go to trial. But nobody ever really wants to go to trial. Okay? You, you want to plead it out that way. I mean, trial is just, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of money being spent. Uh, that's why that's why you plead it to things. And that's one of the re biggest reasons they have the death penalty, I think, is because it's such a uh, plea negotiation tool. All right, we'll take the death penalty off the table if you plead guilty. Okay. <laughs> that seems like that's all it's for. It doesn't deter crime. Uh, that's a whole different video. But... I wanted to answer my friend's text messages who, you know, I got a couple of them, got a couple of emails about specifically this. There's no way he confessed to his, his wife. How could he? Well, uh, hopefully I just explained how he could and how he probably did. I, we don't know whether that's true or not, right? You know? But that's what's being reported, and you just go with it. You know, fine, okay, he did. Am I surprised? Am I shocked? No. I said from day one, I believe they got the right person. I wasn't one of these uh, people that saw people in the bushes, thought it was a conspiracy of five SWAT members or <laughs> whatever people, you know, believed. Was that Idaho or Delphi? They actually believed the police chief was involved. Anyway, uh, it seemed everything, especially with the gun and the extractor marks. Somebody had sent me something saying there's no way they they can track extractor marks. No, they're not. Listen, they wouldn't use it as a tool if it didn't work. You know what I mean? A judge wouldn't be able to look at it and sign off on an affidavit of probable cause for a search warrant if he didn't feel that that worked, that that was an legitimate tool. Unlike a polygraph, where if someone fails a polygraph, you go and say, well, I'm going to get a search warrant based on him failing a polygraph. Any judge that signs that is a moron, you know, because it's not, it's not accepted. But an extractor tool mark is, or... He wouldn't sign off on an affidavit of probable cause saying, hey, well, yeah, go search or whatever it is. You know what I mean? It's accepted. Uh, they test for it. I'm not an expert on it, so I'm not going to sit here and, you know, and explain it because I don't know. But just like anything that they do at a lab, uh, they check for those things. Just like rifling the, the, uh, the barrel, the rifling inside the barrel that is unique to a gun an extractor mark can't do the same thing uh, they wouldn't have used it and put it in the search warrant if it wasn't something that was helpful and they could use is what i guess what i'm trying to say so maybe i'll do a video later on maybe uh richard allen and what to expect um down the road with him I just see, no, I don't, I'm not going to do a waste your time doing a whole video. I see pain and suffer ring, and that's what I see in, in his road, you know, for his future and beyond. So, that's what I see. All right, that's it. Richard Allen, confession to his wife. Do I believe it happened? Yes. Do I believe that the prison recorded it through either a phone call or a visitation inside those walls? Yes, that's probably how it happened. Thank you. End of story. Till next time, Mains out. Okay, today on Unsolved No More, what I want to do is I want to talk about the Delphi uh, defense motion. This 120-plus page uh, motion that they sent to the judge uh, claiming that Richard Allen... Is not responsible, but um, an o Odin religion type cult is. Um, 
So my first impressions on this, very rambling, um, very, uh, you want to say conspiracy oriented in a way, but not quite. I mean, what you have to understand is that the defense has a job to do. And their job is to look at things and make make it look like their client isn't responsible, right? That, that's basically what it comes down to. And, and that's what they're doing here. But there's, there's a couple issues that I, I, I want to talk about because I got a bunch of emails about this and, and you know, hey, are you going to discuss this on your channel? And I originally was not going to because I am waist deep in another case right now. But I had some time this morning. I figured within a half an hour to an hour, I can just discuss this to give you my, my thoughts and opinions on it. Um, the biggest thing that the takeaway that I get from it is you have a description of the crime scene. But you have to be very careful here. And the reason being is it's an interpretation. Okay? It's the, it's the defense's interpretation of what that crime scene is. For example, sticks laid across the body. Um, that is an interpretation. It, the, the, probably the fact is, yes, there are sticks laid across the body. Now, the interpretation would be, hey, they're laid across the body in a specific manner in order to indicate X, Y, and Z. Well, that, you have to back that up and just leave it at sticks laid across the body. The fact that I believe Abby was redressed in Libby's clothes. Uh, again, you can speculate a million times over as to why, and the defense, you know, does that. I, I won't. And the reason I won't interpret this is because I don't have access to the documents. I'm reading an interpretation of what the defense sees when they are looking at it. Um, now, some of the things like... Libby's blood on a tree saying it looks like the letter F which is a symbol for this well I won't go that far but the fact of that is that Libby's blood is painted on a tree that seems to be a fact so I can look at that I, I can't interpret it but I can say it's a fact if they're saying that blood is on that tree. Now, why it's on that tree? You know, that's where I don't want to speculate. The fact. Well, no, this isn't a fact. This is a blatant interpretation from what I read. And you have to insert. You have to be able to separate interpretation from fact. Fact. Interpretation over here. Interpretation is that one person could not do this crime. And then they give a whole litany of reasons why. I could, right beside it, give a whole litany of reasons as to why one person did do it. You see what I'm saying? If any of you have ever been to a trial and sat through at least just closing arguments. Almost always, if you go into it with an open mind, an unbiased mind, when, the, the let's say, the defense gives the closing arguments, which they usually do first, and then the prosecution. So the defense gives it. And after they are done, you are like, oh, well, okay. This guy's innocent. And then the prosecution goes. And he gives it. And they're like, no, it's guilty. And that's why the defense always feels that 
the prosecution always has the upper hand because they get to go last in the closing arguments. They get the last thing, the last input, the last visual into those jurors' minds, right? So it's much like this, reading the interpretation of, as to why one person alone could not do these murders. You're reading it, and now you're believing it because it makes sense. And maybe it does. Sure. Yeah. Th that reason, I'm okay. Yep. But you're not, you're not seeing the other part of it. <clears throat> you're not seeing the prosecution's part that counters that. It's always the back and forth. And I wish it wasn't that way. Uh, but it is. Um, and you can't fault the defense. They're doing a job. Now, some of the things I read there... Uh, and I kind of classify it as dirty. But that, that's, that, again, that's an interpretation, you know. The fact is that they said a police officer is lying. He's lying about a witness's statement seeing Richard Allen in a blue coat when obviously it was tan. And, they, and he's lying. He's blatantly lying. Now, if that is true, it should be exposed. You can't twist a statement to make it match what your theory is. And if that occurred, there should be repercussions. But if that is not a fact, and you are throwing that officer's name around as dirty. Let me tell you something. Nobody, nobody hates a dirty cop more than a good cop. Okay? But if, if you're doing it with, with the sole purpose to get your client off, then you're wrong. And then you need to be held accountable for your actions. Now I will say, if they put that into a motion that's going to be on record in front of a judge, I'm sure that they have something to back that up. Example, they may have the statement from 2017 from the witness who said, I saw a man with a tan jacket on walking towards his car. He wasn't muddy or bloody. That's all I saw. In the affidavit of probable cause, if that officer writes, the witness saw a man in a blue jacket and he had blood and mud on him walking to his car. I, I, find, a hard, I find it hard to believe that a police officer on a probable cause affidavit is going to insert those facts to make it fit his vision. I, call me biased, if you will, but I find it hard to believe. Is it possible that the witness said, I saw a man in a tan jacket, no mud and blood, walking towards the car in 2017, and that is the written statement that the defense got. But what they don't know, maybe is that the police officers and investigators went back to that woman in 2020 and said, hey, do you have any more info? Yeah, I don't think that it was tan. I think his jacket was blue. And he did, did seem to have something on him. might have been mud or blood. And maybe that is how there was a... I, I don't know. I'm just trying to, you know, hypothesize here a little bit and give some thoughts as to why there's a discrepancy there. Um, but back to the crime scene. I don't want to interpret, for example, pre-sawed twigs made to be fashioned as antlers placed on one of the girls. Now, that surely can be interpreted 
a million different ways. Now, originally when I saw this, I immediately thought of the True Detective first first series, I maybe first episode. Um, the pre-sawing, if that is a fact and not an interpretation, is not only troublesome. But boy, you're going to have to start digging deeper into the psyche of the individual who's responsible for this. Now, I believe in my earlier assessment of the case, off of the limited facts that I've known, I said it was, I believed, a planned abduction. And the girls ran and they were killed. If you go off of this, I guess that could still be true. But it doesn't appear to be. It appears that, obviously, going off of the defense motion, premeditated, um, certainly a sexual fantasy still in my mind. They believe it's a cult killing. I don't believe that. Although I will say that there, some of the stuff that they say has merit. Some of it goes into crazy land a little too much for me. Almost like it's a... Uh, an, I don't know, a 15-year-old kid in their mom's basement on a computer uh, with their hoodie up typing a fantasy. That's what some of it seems to me. Uh, but some of it does have merit. And of course, if they're coming out with a motion, and I don't even know what the motion was. If it's a motion to dismiss, I'm assuming... Um, because Richard Allen isn't the offender, of course you're going to lay out a 100-page... It has to be a big motion with a lot of theory into it, but you have to have evidence to back that theory up. And they do an interpretation of that evidence. It's all about interpretation. Because you could get the same piece of evidence, crime scene photos, and look at it and say, oh, there's nothing... N nothing cult-like or, or a uh, ritual about this. I was just trying to, and you've seen it, I've seen it hundreds of times, hastily bury somebody with sticks on them. And that's it. Somebody else could look at it and be like, oh, those sticks spell a symbol. It's just like the Zodiac. It is just like the Zodiac, where people... We'll look at a code and come up with a hundred different names. Ken Maines' name is in that code. I've got emails that said that. Okay. My father's name is in this code. Case breakers. Who said they solved it. Had a name in there. And it's all about the interpretation. It's that's that's what it's all about. So when you look at a crime scene either when you're there or hindsight when you are home two years later looking at the photographs it's all about interpretation and that interpretation is based on your background on how you were raised how you were schooled what your train of thought is okay so again i i don't put too much stock into this and by that I just mean it's it's their interpretation I, I know I sound like a repeating record saying that but until I looked at the crime scene photos and give my interpretation um, I, I can't I can't make sense of it to be honest because his, their description of the crime scene is absolutely crazy. You think of, I think of Sharon Tate and Susan Atkins dipping a towel into her blood and writing pig on the front door. Um... That 
certainly was a cult killing. Maybe they are thinking the same way. But I almost said interpretation again. I'm not going to say it. I will say that the crime scene seems just absolutely based off of that of what they wrote I don't have any other word than crazy like you know when you start taking the victim's blood and writing things it does boggle my mind because The more I sit here and think about it, it's almost as if the person had to be almost mentally ill. In a way. And the reason being, not because of all the, the twigs and sticks and the undressing and the redressing in somebody else's clothes. Not that. It's that whoever did this, it appears took the time to stage this. Even if it was j just the blood on a tree and not blood spatter and not a pooling of blood down at the base. We're talking if this is correct, the defense motion, and it's written, written the person had to feel either A, comfortable there and I find that very hard to believe it's during the middle of a, a wooded area like that where there's foot traffic and you feel comfortable enough to to live out this fantasy where you're placing sticks painting in blood yes when you first hear that you think very much so like a cult like thing but even a let's say it was you still feel that comfortable to do that at that location and that's why i said all along that i believe it was a planned abduction you nope know, and then we found out that he backed in his car and i was like "Ooh, okay well that could further lead credence to he was planning on abducting them they got to that crick he lost control they began to run and then I read this and I was like, well, that doesn't really make sense because he undressed them or had them undressed more than likely with threat of bodily injury to them. And then did he redress Abby in Libby's clothes or was it more of, hey, get dressed now because he was done sexually assaulting them? And her clothes were nearby. She's scared or he throws her. It doesn't matter how she gets Libby's clothes. She gets them on and dresses herself under fear of what he just she just saw happen to her friend. And now he's going to abduct her. And then she runs, whatever it does. And so he kills her too. I don't know. Again, those are all interpretations. But that's what they're doing. And for them saying, hey, she's redressed in Libby's clothes. And therefore, it's a ritual. Um... That, that's just an, I'm going to say it, I don't care. It's an interpretation of the evidence. But that's what everybody does. That's what the prosecutor does. That's what the police officers do. That's what I do. It's an interpretation. And I guess I would tell you what, you, you have to make up your own minds. You know, right now you're probably saying, well, let's say two weeks ago. You're watching and you're saying Richard Allen is the individual responsible because it's very suggestive, right? He was arrested. You read a probable cause affidavit. You seen the evidence about the bullet matching his gun and you're, and he was admitted being there in the area. So you're like, well, they got the right guy. You still have some conspiracy theorists and people that just don't like the police and they're saying no way, no way, no way, no way, no way. 
And then the defense motion comes out, and the same people that are reading it that thought Richard Allen is guilty is now having doubts. That's natural. That's going to happen until now the prosecution puts something out. And then you're going to read it and say, I knew it all along. It was Richard Allen. You, you have to look at it through unbiased eyes and see what makes sense. Now, again, this... I don't know nothing about this cult, this religion. That I, don't, I haven't researched it, and I'm not going to. But I will say that it's a possibility. And the defense knew that, and they looked at it and said, it's, it's a possibility, let's go with that defense. Think of Casey Anthony. And they had to come up with a defense of why she was lying all the time. Everybody knew she was lying, and come up with something. Okay, Casey did know she was dead, but her dad did it. They, Jose Baez had to come up with something, and he did, and the jury bought it. You don't think defense teams and attorneys throughout the country or world learned from him? Listen, we can't explain something. Okay, let's just go with this. This makes sense. The jury will buy it. And now, maybe it's true. I don't know. I don't have the police files to be able to tell. Uh, I'm much as an armchair detective now as a lot of you because I don't have the information. And so what do we do when we don't have the information? We start guessing, like all these people from the Idaho case. Guessing right off the bat. It's the hoodie guy. Actually, it's the chief of police. What's he doing there? It's the food truck guy. It's the ex-boyfriend. It's a drug cartel because the mom... See, you just start guessing before you have everything. Sometimes you won't get everything. This is, this is how the, the system works, and you have to guess. Um, and I, I understand that. It's the world we live in, and we want to know. We want truth. We want more, more, and more until we're satisfied. I don't know what to say other than the defense seems to be doing their job. Richard, Richard Allen maybe should be happy that he has those attorneys. Um, it was a lot to digest. I tried to hone in on the crime scene part of it. Because, you know, really that's my specialty. Crime scene assessments. But without photographs, and you're going off of words, and you're going off the interpretation of somebody else, eh, it's hard. I would rather have that crime scene report in words from the police report because that's unbiased. They're not defending anybody. They're not pointing the finger at anybody. It's the first people on scene. Hey, this is what we see. You know, even, of course, you want to have the crime scene photos. That's essential. But if you don't have them, I would rather have words from a police report than from a defense. And on the flip side, I would rather have the police reports from the day there than after they make an arrest and the prosecution puts out something. Because that's biased as well. So, that's what I think about this. I know that's probably not what you all wanted to hear. You wanted me to go in depth about what I see and you know what the crime scene tells me. But I just can't do that. That I would be doing a disservice to uh, Libby and Abby and her friends and family if I started just trying to interpret off of somebody else's interpretation of the crime scene. All right, and I won't do that. Um, I'll leave that for the other other people out there that you know want to get their clicks in and you know make their speculations. Uh, I just won't do that. I just. It's a very rambling, but very thought out motion. Some of it, when I was reading it, I got a little cringy, you know, shook my head at a couple things. Other things, crime scene, I really put it up close and was read, read it a couple times, looking at facts, not interpretations. Um, and wow, if all that stuff is at that crime scene, 
that's a big assessment that they that needs to be done. I, I'm, I'm as curious as you guys to try to, you know, see how this thing plays out. I'm not arrogant enough to sit here and say, this is who did it. This is why they did it based off of this. Uh, I just won't do that. I don't think any professional will do that. Of course, I have seen professionals get paid a lot of money to go to court to do that. Uh, but hey, that's on them. That's not me. So uh, thanks for listening. I hope this helps. If... If those police reports or something else that comes out that's non-biased about that crime scene, um, I would be willing to do an assessment about that. One thing I want to address before I get off of here is the, the notion that one person couldn't do this. That is the one thing that I will unequivocally deny. Uh, and I will say that one person could do this. Without a doubt. I don't care what the defense. And I read what they had there. Um, I, I don't buy that. One person could do it. Two persons, yeah. Three, four, yes. Certainly could. But one person can do it. I've seen it a hundred times. You've seen it with BTK's first kill uh, with the Otero family. Um, the Idaho case, I've said from the beginning, one person did that. And people say, no, we couldn't have done it. Out. That's something that I will stand firm on. One person could do this crime. Not saying it's Richard Allen, because I don't know. But one person could certainly do it. So I will stay at that, and I will end this show, this episode, with that. Um, and that's all I have to say, as Forrest Gump says. That's all i got to say about that. So enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'm trying to get this out on a Saturday. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All your support. And... Uh, Hey, till next time, Maine's out. Yeah, let's talk about.